That's absolutely right. And looking at these teams of six, I think they both have some flexible options here. It's not just going to be Bass, you down or bust. Oh, Let's there it there. is. <laughs> there it is. The start off the grand finals. It's the Bastion on into the Charger Bug. In Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. Today, I'm gonna show the footage from this past weekend's Portland Pokemon Go Regional. And a little spoiler, if you haven't seen from the title, I end up finishing in second place yet again. This marks my fourth ever official tournament and third ever second place finish. So a little bittersweet, but I honestly wasn't expecting to make it that far in this tournament or really ever again, but we got there somehow this tournament was particularly stacked the current reigning world champion as well as the world championships runner up it's axon and rubik's master were both in attendance along with a lot of other really big name players so overall i'm really proud of how i did and i'm gonna show you all the footage involving myself and my battles so if you miss out on any of the action you can check it out and in about two days i'm gonna release footage regarding the strategies behind why i built my team and why it works so well better than previous bass entities i've ever brought so enjoy the footage and be on the lookout for a strategy video. And we have more amazing battlers coming up because our next matchup, I believe, is going to be with Caleb Pang, a trainer I know very well. I think the one person in the world I've probably talked Pokemon Go with the most. So I can't wait to see him compete versus Zimbo, who's actually a trainer making his first ever tournament appearance. But... He has been playing a lot in the local scene. This year, championship points are available through local tournaments. He's actually part of a group of trainers coming from Seattle, and they tend to do a tournament pretty much every week at Tabletop Village or Mox Boarding House. So it's really cool to see, even though this is his first debut performance in the championship series in a regional, he actually has a lot of experience in Pokemon Go PvP in the local scene. Those local tournaments are such a great way to not only test out teams, but just get experience playing in person. You know, it's so easy to kind of just get into the routine of playing from the comfort of your own home. But let's take a look at these teams that we just saw briefly. Of course, we've got Caleb Pang on the left, very accomplished battler in a lot of ways. Of course, second place last year in San Diego, as well as Fresno, qualified to the World Championships just a couple of times that way. And let's take a look at his Pokemon. He does have that signature Bastiodon that we saw him post on social media before. He's also rocking that Shadow Gligar, which we've seen been uh, so impactful this season so far. I tend to say what Caleb does is called the l Shay Special because he only uses five Pokemon. He never uses that Bastiodon. He just keeps it as bench pressure, kind of as a safety blanket. Whenever he's brought Bastion to tournaments, he's done really well, but he rarely uses it. So I'm really inter interested to see if he will use it today. And let's see how it will match up versus the opposing team here. So I, I yeah. So we've got Zimbo Hidden here, and yeah, talking about that Bastion, I was always has some very polarizing matchups. Gonna do well against things like that Skeleturge, Altaria, and Chargebug, and then of course, very hard losses against Polyrath and Whiskash. Yeah, that double water is gonna be really tough for that Bastion, and it's not only that Bastion will lose that matchup, Bastion is one of those Pokemon that will give the other team momentum. You can either stop their momentum by hard walling it, and then you're so far ahead, or it swings the other way, and if you get matched up with Polyrath, that Polyrath is pretty much gonna counter down. So it's gonna be really risky once again to bring Bastion on. So I'm not sure if Caleb is gonna bring it into this series. That's a great call. It's of course not only the one-on-one -on -one matchup, but how that matchup uh, gives your opponent or you a huge advantage going into the rest of the battle. But I think both of our trainers are actually locked in here. We do see that Polyrath and it's met with the Lickitung on Caleb's side. And this is a non-shadow Polyrath here. And this is a change that we've seen a little bit recently. Before it was almost all Polyrath swap into the charge bug met by the Cresselia. I don't know if this is what you want to bring into the Charger Bug because Charger Bug has an X Scissor, which is super effective versus the Cresselia. I would have liked to see Zimbo bring in potentially that Whiskash instead, which does resist those Volt switches. But Cresselia, you know, a very bulky Pokemon can certainly hit back here. This Future Sight is going to do a lot of damage and potentially put the Charger Bug into the yellow. Yeah, running Future Sight like Colin did in Stuttgart and what that boy Jay actually did in previous iterations of the meta, instead of running the Moonblast, trying to use that for neutral matchup. It's actually going to press the Grass Knot in Caleb knows his counts, knows it's not very effective, lets it go. 
And Caleb actually did invest one shield, potentially reading that because the Cresselia was brought in here. Zimbo potentially doesn't actually have a great answer for the charge bug in the back. So firing off this last Exocer here, I think this is going to be just enough to knock out the Cresselia. And there is no Protect Shield, so that does knock out the Cresselia, but this Charger Bug just has energy, and the Whizcash is going to be coming in, but you're almost at double x Scissor. You're going to be able to hit the double x Scissor. You could even pivot out in, out of this matchup if you want, because Azumarill, in general, is pretty safe once Cresselia is out of the way. Yeah, and of course, Caleb here, all of a sudden in a very good position. Like you said, yeah, Azumarill is going to have a lot of play against both of these remaining Pokemon. Does very well against that Polyrath and against that Whizcash, but I think Caleb is just maybe, you know, Happy to go with kind of a straightforward path to victory here. Just going to let this charge book go down, align the Lickitung here, and align the Azumarill on that Polygraph. And committing to the Scald, which does more damage than the Mud Bomb to secure the knockout into the charge bug. Here comes the Lickitung. The Lickitung oh, does need to still get all the way to that power whip, but between these Licks and Body Slam, it's going to get close to knocking out. So you probably could just go straight Body Slam here. And suddenly, because of that safe swap charge bug, Caleb is really far ahead in this game. Yeah, this Lickitung is putting in a lot of work. Like you said, can't just go straight for the Body Slam. Even if something happens to this Lickitung, I think the Azumarill is going to be able to finish off this battle. And this looks like charge attack priority did register. You didn't get the debuff on the first Scald. Can you get the debuff on the second Scald? And I don't think it's going to matter because this is going to be a power whip. Even if it is debuff, this is double super effective into the Whizcatch and it does get protect shielded. But the problem is we can see these back lines. And also Caleb knows that Polyrath was in the lead. So he knows his Azumarill is going to be matched up versus that Polyrath. Here it comes. Great swap though. Great swap to catch this Body Slam, but unfortunately now this Polyrath is going to be in play for our range for that Azumarill. Caleb just going to be swapping that in. I don't think Zimbo has seen this Azumarill yet, but now potentially knows that that Azumarill is there and going to cause a lot of trouble. And going for the Ice Wind, just trying to get the guaranteed debuff to try to endure on a play rough, but I think you're right. I think between that Body Slam and the Bubbles, it's going to be enough to knock out anyway, and you're just two Bubbles away from that play rough, but Caleb wants to throw on perfect timing, so he goes for that play rough to knock out the Polyrath. Caleb, certainly an expert on the mechanics, on the counts, doing everything right in this Holy. game. Oh, it actually doesn't take out. Polyrath able to get out this last Icy Wind here, but Azumarill, of course, going to be able to take it, no problem, and also going to be able to come out with a little bit of energy for that Whiskash. Azumarill, one of the Pokemon that can just hard wall the Polyrath is such a great answer, but I mean, it, you are throwing bubbles back, so there is play for that Polyrath, but in this scenario where there was no Protect Shield and you took a Body Slam, there was just no hope for that Polyrath. And actually, it's kind of close in the end, but this this play rough is going to secure the game one victory for Caleb Pink. That was a really nice pivot from Caleb in that mid game with that charge bug. Kind of just got so far ahead off of that Cresselia counter swap, right? Came out with a lot of energy and also was able to flip switch advantage to get the Lickitung where he wanted it. Yeah, and in that situation, you always want to switch fast because you don't want to give the opposing Pokemon a huge advantage on energy. But you mentioned during the cast, I think if you swap into that Whizcash, you have a much better opportunity to finish out that game because then you maintain the alignment and then you'll have your Polyrath into that Lickitung, and then you have your Cresselia into the Azumarill, and then that could be a 1-0 on Zimbo's side. So here comes the Azumarill into the Polyrath. It was the same exact Pokemon, exactly what you were mentioning, so, but Caleb switched it up, and that is not great for the Polyrath. Like I said, there is play here, because if you do commit the Protect Shields, you are doing resisted damage, but at least these bubbles are resisted too, and decides to go for the Icy Wind, just wants to guarantee that debuff. Caleb knows it. You really don't want a Protect Shield on Icy Wind, so no Protect Shield. Caleb. I do see Caleb looking at those team sheets, potentially thinking if this Polyrath is staying in Azumarill, oh, Polyrath has a lot of play in the back, and here's that Bastiodon from Caleb. I wonder if he heard you, you know, maybe that was like a challenge to bring out the Bastiodon, which isn't a favorable matchup here against that Cresselia. Yeah, I think he thought it could have some backline play, but in that game number one, you had the Polyrath lead and the Whizcash in the back for Zimbo, so you were ABA strong versus Bastion. so really a Bold choice from Caleb to actually bring the Bastion into game number two, but it's worked out beautifully. The only downside is you'll win this matchup. You don't win it so uh, heavily that the Polyrath can't counter down. So Polyrath is at least going to get an Icy Wind or Skull probably once Bastion wins this matchup. This Cresselia has a ton of energy. I think 1 over 100 here going to be firing off these neutral Grass Knots. Like you said, Cresselia can get the Bastion pretty low, but the Bastion isn't going to be usually coming out with a huge, huge advantage. Yeah, yeah. the Grass Knots are neutral and just Cresselia is so bulky. It just adds up over time. You're still going to be able to probably get another Grass Knot off unless Caleb does throw right before 
for the grass knot. No, you get that grass knot, but I think Caleb actually has to throw energy here. It's it's gonna be kind of clunky if you go for the entire smack down, down, but <laughs> Caleb is the pro in the Bastion. Here comes the Polyrath trying to knock out that Bastion on, but Caleb switches it out. Caleb does save that Bastion, which is going to have some nice play against that Cresselia and Skeledurge in the back. Playrath going to connect here, does a lot of damage, put that Polyrath into the red, but actually still pretty healthy. I don't think you can bubble down from here. Yeah, I, the non-shadow Polyrath is just bulkier to endure those play roughs, and yeah, you're going to land the Scald, but you're also not doing that much damage back. Can you get the debuff? You're going to need something here. You can't get the debuff. There are are two protect shields remaining for both trainers, so it's gonna be kind of a fast attack off, but the problem is it's gonna be really hard to finish off any of these Pokemon with Skeletors. <laughs> Caleb has that Lickitung in the back, hasn't shown it quite yet, but it is going to have a good matchup against both the Cresselia and the Skeletor, so I have to give a little bit of advantage to Caleb here. Yeah, I think Caleb is decently far ahead. Yes, you are going to... No, actually, you don't even knock out the Azumarill. The Azumarill <laughs> has the Ice Beam, and, but you know this isn't terrible, because at least you get an Incinerate out of it. You get one Incinerate, but I think Bastion has a lot of energy, and yeah. it yeah. looks like Caleb instantly pivots into the Lickitung, and I don't think you're going to even see that Bastion on... Uh, or I'm not even sure. Uh, uh, you're gonna protect shield this for sure. There's four protect shields remaining. No, you don't even protect shield it. Wow. Caleb feeling good, not throwing out the protect shields. You know, I was gonna say maybe he could just lick all the way down here. Maybe he still can, but just like you said, that Bastiodon, I believe, has a lot of energy. Uh, very close to 100 because I don't think it threw out the Cresselia, but uh, is throwing off this first power. Maybe just gonna, you know, go this straightforward approach. Just peel away both of those protect shields and finish with the Stone Edge. And first protect shield of the game for either trainer, and it's just you're taking so much damage, but Incinerate's doing a lot of damage back. This Lickitung is actually lower than the Skeletors, but it did take a Disarming Void, so that's a little bit cheating for that Skeletors. <laughs> but going for the next uh, perfect timing there, right before the animation finished on that fast attack of the Incinerate, I mean, Caleb is one of the best out there. That's right, does put up the shield, and here comes these incinerates, but unfortunately Caleb still has a shield, still has energy on the Bastiodon, still has enough health if he wanted to shield this to maybe look down. Looks like Caleb is going to close out with his favorite Pokemon yeah. and bring in that Bastiodon. I think that's what he wanted all along, and he's actually going for the Smackdown, uh, or sorry, the Stone Edge <laughs> instead of the Smackdown, and he just wants the glorious victory for Bastiodon, a rare opportunity for Caleb to win with the Bastiodon, but he does it here in this game number two to sweep the series and move on in this Group D on the winner's side. Fantastic series from Caleb, getting that 2-0 victory over Zimbo. Great to see Zimbo play in his Play Pokemon debut there. It gets to be on stream, and we will uh, potentially have a chance to see Zimbo later. Is going to drop down to that loser's bracket for now, though. Yeah. Well, let's hear about his mindset right now, because we have an interview with with Caleb Ping and Home Slice Henry. Take it away. Hey everybody, it's uh, Home Slice Henry here and I'm joined by the one and only caster extraordinaire and now taking a turn back in the battler's chair, Mr. Caleb Pang, how are you doing today? I'm feeling good, you know, uh, won my first set of battles on stream and got to bring Bastion as well to take the win. So uh, that's a win-win for me. That was going to be my question is, you're obviously, I would say at this point as a competitor, well known for bringing the Bastion on. Well, maybe necessarily having it as bench pressure, but in game number two, in came the Basti into that Cresselia, and it didn't matter how many grass knots, Basti was just inevitable. Yeah, and you know, I talked to some people, they said, you should just bring Carbink instead, it's a lot safer, but it just doesn't handle stuff like Cresselia, Lickitung as much. And if you see the top usage of game number one, Bastion beats a lot of things. And I know a lot of people say it's kind of RPS hard to use, um, but I had to bring it because if it's always bench pressure, no one's gonna respect it unless they see it on the field. Absolutely. And to be fair, we have seen in some of these matches an uptick in ground types, which is a bit worrying for our rock steel friend Bastion. Uh, Gligar, top usage, and the Whiz Cash as well. So, do you have a, I mean, you don't have to share it, but do you have a game plan for how you're going to overcome these ground types? Well, honestly, the first set of battles with the Shadow Latios had me really concerned. So, I was like, at least I have Bastion for that one. But yeah, I do have some plans for the ground water types, the water types, the fighters in general, just because. I've been playing Bastion my entire career, and it's terrible in all those matches. So you heard it here. here you heard it here first, folks. I am struggling with my words a bit, but you heard it here first. Bastion on its demise has been drastically overstated as Caleb Peng is able to take the two to zero win and bring the Bastion as well. So 
Bravo, Caleb, and I can't wait to see what you're able to do with the rest of this tournament as well. Will we see more Basti, or is it going back on the bench? Uh, well, who knows? We'll see. I might go 0-2 after this one, but I'm just glad I got to showcase a little Basti on stream so far. Uh, but happy to be here, and yeah, thank you for the interview. Absolutely, and a good luck to you the rest of the way. Ready, but we have an absolute, I would say a heavyweight bout coming up here, Phoebe. We have Caleb Pang on one side, twice the runner-up at previous regionals, has qualified for Worlds before with his trusty Bastiodon versus number two at Portland last year and number two at Worlds, Rubik's Master. Two titans collide here in the semifinals of day number one. And he's built the excitement and we are ready. Our players up on stage and there are the teams. Caleb Peng bringing that Azumarill, Bastiodon, Lickitung, Three extremely bulky Pokemon, followed by Shadow Gligar, that Chargebug, and a Shadow Polyrath. And on the side of Rubik's Master, we have that Cresselia, the Shadow Alolan Sandslash, the Azumarill, which, if I remember correctly, is on the Ice Beam and Play Rough moveset, the Registeel, the Trevenant, and a bit of an interesting pick here. We've seen some variety in Flyers, but we do see the Mandibuzz on the side of Rubik's Master. Now, so let's look at the movesets for Caleb. His team, the Azumarill, is running Play Rough Ice Beam as well, so no great coverage for those Steel types. Bastidon on the very typical sets, Smackdown, Flamethrower, Stone Edge, Shadow Gligar, Lickitung, Polyrath, and Charger Bug. No surprises here. Running Icy Wind and Scald. No power up punch. You and I talked about it a little bit. I I, I said I don't I don't really I'm not I'm a not a strong believer in the power up punch. I think you give away too much, and in open team sheets, you don't get enough back. Very fair, and and we do see, as you had mentioned, with Metacham, we saw Power Up Punch, the Polyrath running the Icy Wind and Scald, but we do not see a counter user on Rubik's Master's team. We saw in San Antonio, Dunebug actually winning San Antonio without a counter user, and we've seen more people follow that trend. For the movesets, Rubik's Master is on the standard Grass on Future Sight on Cresselia, the Alolan Sand Slash is Shadow, and has the Shadow Claw, and we did note the Mandibuzz on Snarl, and instead of Foul Play, opting for the slightly harder hitting Dark Pulse. And as it typically is when you run a Pokemon like Bastion, I think this is really going to come down to where that Bastion lands if it is run, because there are so many polarizing matchups on Rubik's Master's side. You don't have the Hydro Pump on the Azumarill. You're going to be doing amazing as the Registeel. Trevenant, although it's a Grass versus Rock type, doesn't really uh, stand up due to the bulk difference. And here we go into game number one, and we actually don't even see the Bastion. It's going to be Polyrath versus Trevenant. We see a quick swap into the Charger Bug. And this Charger Bug up energy could prove to be problematic for the line that Rubik's Master has brought. As we see the Charger Bug able to outpace the Trevenant, fire off this X Scissor, and the X Scissor will do very meaningful damage to that Trevenant. It is going to be able to resist the Volt Switches, though, so not really threatened by the fast attacks. Throwing the first Shadow Ball, Gale Peng recognizing this is likely going to be a Shadow Ball, not a bait and going to throw up a shield of his own. Going down shields, throwing the next x -Scissor. This would pull a shield from Rubik's Master if he wants to preserve this Trevenant. I think a lot of this has made sense so far. No switch from Rubik's Master, I want to point out, because there's not an amazing answer in the back. Registeel's okay, but preferring the Trevenant here because he knows that Shadow Ball will be able to knock out, doing lots of damage with the Shadow Claws as well. Absolutely. And again, the pacing of the Charger Bug is able to outpace the Trevenant here. So this could get a bit difficult as we see the final Protect Shield used and Caleb looks like he's one bolt switch away from another X Scissor here. Is he going to be able to flip switch advantage? I think if Rubik's Master ends up going for a Shadow Ball, he's going to uh, pace at the same time, actually catching the charge attack onto Lickitung. However, this isn't the Shadow Ball, so it actually worked out for Rubik's Master. This is the charge attack he'd want to throw in this matchup. He's now able to switch into the Registeel, and he knows, he remembers Caleb Peck led the Polyrath, and now he's able to line up the Cresselia later in the game. Game. This is great alignment for Rubik's Master. Absolutely. Rubik's Master understanding that just because your opponent switched doesn't mean you have to as well. Being able to take advantage of the fact that Caleb gave up switch once and gives up switch once again. And now we see the Focus Blast landing into the Lickitung. No shields remaining for the opponent, so this damage will land. A very interesting undercharge. Able to get a few more lock-ons now, not knocking out. The Lex Body Slam was actually just unable to be reached from Caleb. I don't think it would have been terribly impactful, but this is really 
really nice. Caleb still has a good amount of health left on the charger, but because of that catch earlier, and I think the energy here from Rubik's Master is going to be super impactful. Reaching the Zap Cannon to a Shadow Polyrath, will this knock out? This is going to be good by Mr. Polyrath, I'm afraid. The Zap Cannon connects. Good by Polyrath. All that's left in the back is the Charger Bug, and Charger Bug still has to deal with a full health Cresselia in the back, and Rubik's Master with the absolute nail in the coffin there. The Discharge catch onto the Trevenant. What a catch by Rubik's Master. Rubik's Master really showing his mastery of this game. Actually, I love this. I love this. Going into the Registeel, preventing Caleb from having the knowledge of the third Pokemon in the back. This is incredible play from Rubik's Master showing exactly how he was able to get second place in Worlds just this past season. That was absolutely masterful. As you mentioned, choosing not to reveal the third because information on what your opponent runs in game number one can potentially influence what you choose to run in game number two. So Rubik's Master not giving as much information to Caleb Pang. Caleb Pang so was unable to get information from that game number one as you pointed out. So. Going into game number two, a little bit less, a great lead again for Rubik's Master. And we do the safe switch into the charge bug, this time going to be answered by that Trevenant. And Trevenant is, of course, as we mentioned, going to get outpaced in this matchup. But the difference is one X Scissor is survivable for this Trevenant, whereas a Shadow Ball would come very close to knocking out the charge bug. I think it's a bit of an interesting position. If Caleb ends up two shielding, two shadows, actually lets it go, never mind. That's gonna put the charge of a, into the range of a shadow claw down, but now Rubik's Master has to make a decision. Do I want to maintain switch advantage or do I want to win a uh, shield advantage? Opting for switch advantage, I think that's the right call. Energy on the Trevenant's going to be pretty good, able to hit at least for meaningful seed bomb damage into this licking tongue. Now the question will be, Seed Bomb number one is reached. Is Rubik's Master going to have enough health left on the Trevenant to make it to a second Seed Bomb? One Seed Bomb connects. That's already getting closer to Focus Blast range. Trevenant, this is going to be close, and it runs out of HP. So Caleb Peng not only has a shield advantage, but has an energy lead as well. Aggressive switch into the Gligar, which is answered by the Future Sight Cresselia. And I think this is pretty good team compositional uh, understanding from Caleb here, recognizing that once you pull out uh, the Actually, honestly, the Trevenant's not that great against Gligar. Gligar looks really good against all three of the Pokemon that Ru Rubik's Master uh, brought to this game. And it's going to take that first Grass Knight quite comfortably, get to the dig, great shield by Rubik's Master. I think this is going to be the matchup where he actually has the most value with his health because the charge attacks from Registeel and the fast attacks from Registeel just don't do that much to Gligar. Absolutely, and even though the Baiting out the Trevenant doesn't necessarily help the Gligar. It does in the fact that Caleb was able to get that shield advantage. And now with the shield advantage in this end game, I mean, Rubik's Master has zero fast move pressure here into the Gligar. Kind of like what we saw in that earlier Mormon Mad matchup, saving two shields for a Pokemon when your opponent doesn't have good fast move pressure here. And now the Gligar is going to be extremely difficult for Rubik's Master to remove from the field of play. I think this is good for Rubik's Master. Getting this grass not off, I think Caleb could have thrown at charge attack tie, but he's going to instead opt for a big farm up, throwing the aerial ace. I don't think aerial ace would have been enough earlier, and now coming out with a full dig to hit this Registeel. The Registeel does have some energy, but is not quite at it yet. There are no shields on the play. This dig is going to land, take the Registeel probably into the yellow, and another charge attack will be uh, required in order to knock out, but it looks like there's going to be a charge attack coming in from the Registeel first. We do see Ready Seal forced to go for the Focus Blast, cannot afford to take another dig, and it will come down to this. The Lickitung got some energy earlier farming down the Trevenant. Lickitung, typically not a fan of going against Ready Steel here. Can Lickitung do enough damage? Ready Steel getting closer to the Focus Blast, but first the Body Slam gets thrown. Resisted Body Slam times two. Will it be enough to knock out the Registeel? It looks like not quite yet, but the additional lick damage, not quite enough. The Focus Blast comes through. Caleb Peng shaking his head, I think recognizing that this is going to be just about enough to knock out, and it does. 2-0 to Rubik's Master, knocking down Caleb Peng into the loser's side of the bracket. Unbelievable plays by Rubik's Master. Down a shield in the end game. That Shadow Gligar looking deadly, but 
still able to fight back, grab those shields away from the Gligar. Without those shields, you can make it to that Focus Blast. Gligar normally a very difficult matchup for the Registeel, but again, it was teamwork there. Getting health down on the Gligar, getting away those shields with Grass Knots, and then the Registeel standing strong, taking down the Lickitung. What a series from two amazing competitors. Uh, we have an awesome last matchup of the day. It is gonna be Caleb Pang versus Beach to end us off. And Caleb Pang, we have seen on stream, speaking of Rubik's Master, by the way, whoever wins this matchup, I believe, does play Rubik's Master in those losers finals tomorrow. So if that person is Caleb, I think that's actually a rematch for the two of them. Yeah, that will be a rematch to try to take out that world champ finalist. And as we know, Caleb Pang has always been the finalist, which is awesome. He's qualified two times for the World Championship. Really impressive, but he's still trying to win that regional championship. He's on that loser's side of the bracket. He's trying to make top 12 going into day number two to try to have that rematch against Beach, who is a trainer that has uh, is nothing to scoff at in championship series. He has had a lot of awesome performances. He just maybe kind of the mind joke of North America, has played in a lot of these regionals, has top cut a lot of them, but wasn't quite able to secure his invite last season. But this season, I think, is going to benefit a lot from that championship point system. Does go to a lot of these tournaments and often gets very far as we're seeing here today. Yeah, I believe he has gotten multiple top cuts and a lot of number nine as well. Fresno, he was ninth. Milwaukee, he was ninth. So just on the edge of these top cuts. And then Portland last year, he actually got seventh. So he was on that top cut. He was top cut in Knoxville as well. And he just has a ton of tournament experience. Peoria top cut, I have to agree with you. He is similar in that way where he's been so close, just like my joke was. And can he get over the edge and have an awesome run? Because as we saw in San Antonio, Doombug, just made a ridiculous run on that loser side. So any one of these trainers can win it all from the loser side. Just like it's Axon was saying, it's not over until it's over. And let's take a look at Caleb's team here. We saw him earlier today. We have that Bastion on still, and he actually has used it today, Butters. It's not just bench pressure. And then of course the rest of the team looking pretty meta there. We've got the Azumarill, like we've been saying, on the Uprise. We've also got that Shadow version of the Gligar. Yeah, Shadow Gligar has been looking really strong. It's obviously number one in usage, but Azumarill has been that standout. Let's look at Beach aside. How many Bastion on counters do you have? And you have two ground types. You have the Whizcash and the Gligar. That's going to be quite strong. And then you have the Vigoroth as well. And yes, you will be throwing those resisted body slams and the Rock Side into Bastion on. But counter damage is just enough. And otherwise, pretty typical attacks Azumarill with that play rough and Ice Beam. And just like we were saying, that Bastiodon has a lot of counters, and I think that Azumarill as well does decently against the Bastiodon. Remember, Bubble does just a little bit more damage. I think Azumarill actually looks pretty safe for both sides here. Of course, both sides do have that charge bug you need to watch out for, but aside from that, Azumarill has a lot of play. Yeah, and I feel like Caleb's team, he told me before that he was a little worried about Charger Bug. That's actually why he brought the Bastion on. And Charger Bug does look decent against everything that's not Gligar and Bastion on. And if you're scared to bring the Bastion on, then it's good against everything but the Shadow Gligar. We're going to see in the game number one. No, we're going to see the Lickitung into the Azumarill. And this is exactly what you want to see if you're Caleb. Lickitung has a great matchup against Azumarill. You take these charge moves and these bubbles so nicely. And then, of course, you have that super effective power whip. I'd kind of be interested to see whether Beach is going to swap out at some point. Yeah, and you have that Vigoroth in the back, which is really tough. You would rather match up that Vigoroth into that Lickitung, but you're probably never going to get that matchup. So do you try to pivot? I mean, obviously, you're not going to try to pivot into the Whizcash here because you don't want to take that power whip into that Whizcash, but you don't also want to take the power whip into the Azumarill. Vigoroth is looking fairly safe against the backline of Caleb, but Beach doesn't know if the Shadow Polyrath is lurking or not. Yeah, and that's great news for Beach, but he doesn't know it yet. Like you said, the Polyrath is not there, and Vigoroth actually does pretty well against Azumarill and Gligar. Even though they both resist counter, uh, Vigoroth is able to get off a lot of damage just with those body slams. And it looks like Beach is just going to go for the soft loss here. And in a lot of metas, soft losing a matchup is not terrible because you're going to get a counter down here, and it looks like an instant pivot from Caleb thinking that his Azumarill is going to be really safe against everything in the back of Beach, and it's a great call. It's a great team read from Caleb. Looks like Beach didn't bring that charge bug, and like we were saying, Azumarill is pretty safe into everything that isn't charge bug, going to be resisting these counters.
counters. And of course, has a great matchup versus that Wiz Cash as well. Yeah, and actually throwing on a bubble here, I think, was Beach. So that gave some extra energy to the Azumarill. And like you mentioned, it's one of the few fighting types, or sorry, pseudo fighters that can do decently against the Azumarill because you just are able to absorb these Ice Beams, absorb these play roughs. And I actually like the decision to go Ice Beam because you're not going to knock out with play rough. You might as well go for double Ice Beam. Figure off is slowly chipping away at this Azumarill here. Almost at another body slam. And there it is. Throwing on good timing there as well. Caleb probably just going to let this go and hope that his Gligar can put in some work in the back. Yeah, and Caleb actually could have thrown the Ice Beam to cut off that Body Slam, but decided to get a little bit more energy here and go for the timing. And he does get that proper timing and the knockout into the Vigoroth. And can you get to another charge attack? Maybe you would have rather cut off that Body Slam. Here comes Pivot, another Pivot. Everyone's pivoting everywhere. And it's going to be Ground Type versus Ground Type. Two Protect Shields remaining for both trainers. And these attacks chops are going to be critical here. Caleb just brought in this Gligar, which means he's actually locked in. If Beach is able to get some Scalds debuffs off before he's out of shields, I think that's going to be really oh, great. No oh, he doesn't get it. He doesn't get the debuff there. And here comes the Aerial Ace before the Scald is available because you want to start throwing these Aerial Aces before you get debuffed. I actually imagine Caleb is going to go for the back-to-back -back here, either an Aerial Ace or a Dig, and it's big because you actually got the protection. Shield. Does it go for the back-to-back, Oh -back, my goodness, though? that's a Mud Bomb. Oh no, it is! And but he gets, gets the, the shield thing. anyways. But the problem you don't get that attack debuff now. Yeah, and it is less energy, so are you going to try to outpace here, get to that skull before the double aerial ace? You're not going to get there before the double aerial ace. Do you give up your last protection here? Yes, you do. Do you back to back if you're Caleb? Also, you can get back your timer if you throw another charge attack. Your here feature comes just mashing it. He's mashing the skulls, and there it is. And that is absolutely huge. Needed to land this on the Gligar. And is this going to knock out? Is this enough? No, it's not going to knock out the Shadow Gligar, but the attack finally drops. Here comes the swap into the Lincoln Tongue to clear that debuff and the mud bomb is not coming up and the body slam is gonna land but it doesn't matter because you don't get the power whip so you're actually gonna be able to just one shot down i believe Whiskash needs a lot of energy here. Caleb has so many Pokemon left, but they're all energy dry and very low on health as well. Beach trying to farm as much as he can. Trying to go for the entire Mud Shot down, but now he has two charge attacks. I think Wait, at a, what? But it doesn't doesn't Gligar just have an aerial ace? I think Gligar just has an aerial ace. I think Gligar has it. I think Caleb is gonna win the cap and win this game number one with the aerial ace. No! Wait a second! No, he didn't have the opportunity to throw the dig or the aerial ace, and Beach is able to take the win here, but it feels like you probably should have been able to press that aerial ace or dig or sorry, dig there. Yeah, I'm not actually sure about who wins that charge attack priority. I think it should be Gligar in most cases. It looks like Caleb is talking to Dunebug. Shout out to Dunebug, by the way, of course, San Antonio regional champion. And maybe going to look into whether that game is going to go on the record or not. Yeah, so it was clear that Caleb did have the charge attack. He had the energy for Dig and Aerial Ace, but he didn't throw it at the end there to get that charge attack priority. So Beach is able to throw that Scald and win the game here. But like you mentioned, we don't know what's gonna happen in terms of review. I imagine they will probably review it and it looks like that's what Doombug is gonna do right there. Beach was definitely playing to the win condition at the end there. I think as soon as Caleb swapped out with a charge attack, the game was pretty much over. But, you know, Beach is kind of hoping, okay, maybe the Gligar doesn't have energy. If I mudshot down and come out with two charge attacks, that's my win condition. But, of course, Caleb did have that charge attack, so Dune probably going to be reviewing that and seeing what should have happened. Yeah, and if we look at this end game again here, and this is where the Scald is going to hit this Gligar, but it's key to see how much energy this Gligar has before he swaps. Dig and then swap. So he banks the dig. And then this is crucial. As soon as he lands this body slam, this is what puts the Whizcash into guarantee range of either Aerial Ace or Dig. So now, yes, you use the Scald and then you're gonna use another charge attack. But as you can see, you didn't have the opportunity if you're Caleb Pang. So Beach was able to land that Scald without going into a charge attack priority. And we're getting word from the floor that that's exactly what uh, Caleb has said, that he didn't have the opportunity to throw the charge attack. It looks like the buttons may have come up just a half second late there when uh, when that Gligar came in at the end. We're in really good hands with Dune and looks like a little fist bump there. So there was a conclusion. As soon as we know what that is, we'll let you know. We have final confirmation. He is taking the loss. So a huge shout out to Beach 
I just want to give him a lot of credit, especially from a trainer that's really been on the edges of reaching his ultimate goal, making it further into day number two, a multiple top nine appearances. To have the courage to concede that game in a moment like this, that is just awesome from Beach. I want to give a lot of credit to Beach. You're absolutely right. It takes a lot of courage here in this moment. You know, I don't think there's a rule that ever forces a player to concede uh, when it's neither of the players' fault like that. But, you know, Beach kind of recognizing that the game was over, that Caleb should have been able to throw that dig or the aerial ace, whichever came. And um, looks like Caleb is taking that 1-0 victory here, and they're going into game two. Great integrity from Beach. I mean, just I, a lot of props to him as a person and as a trainer. And here we are, game number two. Beach is down 0-1 because Caleb did win that game. And now we got Charger Bug on Charger Bug. And again, Charge Attack priority is gonna matter. Who wins Charge Attack priority? This time, it's Beach winning Charge Attack priority. And look at those back lines. Alignment is going to be critical here. If you're Caleb, you want the Polyrath on the Lickitung and the Azumarill on the Gligar, and you certainly don't want the opposite. But the interesting thing about this mirror match is that two Excessors doesn't actually take out a Charge Bug. Look at that, they're both in the green there. So it's gonna come down to those Volt switches at the end. Interesting, so yeah, we're gonna see who will win this mirror. It won't come down to that charge attack priority. As you can see, this Excessor does not knock out. The next Excessor is gonna be coming in from Beach's side to land into Caleb. A Volt Switch is coming through, so it's gonna be Volt Switch on Volt Switch. Caleb decides to go for the alignment out of nowhere, and he's gonna get the Volt Switch down. Oh no, does he? I think he does. Oh. No, he doesn't, and he has to swap into the Azumarill, but he does catch that x at least. But the great thing is, remember, this Azumarill is incredibly safe as long as the charge bug is out of the way, and it is certainly out of the way now. That charge bug is going to faint later to any fast attack, and here comes that Lickitung from Beach. This Azumarill is a little bit chunked from that x but I think still is out of range of a single power win. Yeah, but the problem is, two shield Gligar is going to be so strong in the back versus Caleb, because charge bug has a little bit of health. You don't don't really have to respect that energy. You're gonna be able to handle that matchup no problem, taking Volt Switchers and X Scissors, and then you can have those Protect Shields for those Icy Winds in the back from the Shadow Polyrath. So Beach is actually in a really good position because of his backline Pokemon. Unfortunately, Caleb throwing up that shield in the lead, going for that Volt Switch down, but Beach's charge bug was able to hang on with just a sliver of health, which kind of forced Caleb to give a switch advantage, which remember was the goal probably of that protect shield. And barely holds on because that body slam doesn't knock out. Lands the play rough here. And do we see another pivot? We know Caleb likes to keep these Pokemon around at very low health, comes for the pivot, and Beach is still switch locked. So great play by Caleb to manipulate the switch timer like that. Now he has an energy advantage going into the Shadow Gligar that has a protect shield advantage. And this is a tough position for Caleb but certainly has a little bit of play. You know, this is maybe the worst case scenario for this Polyrath, but uh, is able to get off this Icy Wind first because of that little energy advantage. And remember that Charger Bug he has is still loaded with energy. Obviously, Gligar resists all of Charger Bug's attacks, but potentially, if you have enough damage and if this Gligar gets debuffed enough, Charger Bug still has play. Yeah, but how do you get it low enough? Because this next Icy Wind is going to get protection. And here comes the swap into the Charger Bug. This is the free counter, too. And now it's locked in forever. Yeah, it is locked in forever. Great point. You just removed your ability to drop that debuff here, and then now you can't really aerial ace that charge bug, and can you even get the wing attack down? You can't, so you have to throw this energy. How many X scissors is it gonna take? Is it gonna take three X scissors? I think it's gonna take three, but this Gligar doesn't have a lot of energy now, and Caleb still has a little bit of an Azumarill if, if he needs to go for a catch. Oh, looks like he barely only has one, a little bit more than one X scissor of energy. Does this X scissor do half of what this Gligar has left? I don't think so, but maybe the Volt switches are gonna add up. Yeah, almost, oh. almost half actually. And now you get oh. a swap on the aerial ace. A ridiculous catch by Caleb Peng to absorb that. And now, like you mentioned, I think with the Volt switch damage, this X scissor is gonna be enough. And out of nowhere, it looks like Caleb Peng is gonna win this series two to zero. An impossible comeback from Caleb there. Incredible play, making a catch with a four turn fast move user in that charger bug. That is so tough. That's why Charger Bug, Skeledurge, those Pokemon with the clunky fast attacks are really difficult to switch with. And Caleb was able to swap on the Aerial Ace. Maybe Beach thought that swap wasn't going to happen because who would even go for it? 
but Caleb went for it and it worked out and he takes that series two to zero to move on to day number two in Portland. I think that was one of the best comebacks of the day that we've seen so far. Caleb looked like he was in such a tough position, going down a shield, losing switch advantage, getting the polyrath on that Gligar, but somehow, some way was able to pull it out. Needed a catch, needed a charger bug to take out a Gligar. I mean, I'd love to see some replays of that game. So that, let's hear from one of our veteran trainers. We have Caleb on the floor, fresh off his victory with Home Slice Henry. Hey everybody, Home Slice Henry here, joined once again by Caleb Pang. And if you're getting interviewed twice in one day, you've probably been doing something right. So Caleb, welcome back, my friend. All right, glad to be here. It's been a long day, but uh, glad we can wrap it up on a pretty fun victory there. Absolutely, and going into that matchup, I mean, going up against a pretty formidable competitor in Beach, able to get that two to zero win, but what I wanna focus on, Caleb, walk me through that game number two. The catch at the end there, because at that point, if you don't make that catch, you're not winning that game. Yeah, I mean, especially with a four turn of bolt switch on Charger Bug, he could pretty much throw in a, and prevent me from catching. So I had to go for a little pause there uh, to ensure that I could get that catch off and it worked out timing wise. So uh, hopefully made for some entertaining content for everyone too. The high level mechanics working out as, I mean, so far, all you've done when competing basically is top cut and you're back. The, I mean, previously I believe it was California, but now moving a little northward still, you know, in the Pacific Northwest area, but Day number two coming up, and, and it looks like, I mean, I've been looking through that top 12. We have some serious competition there, so are we gonna see the A game from Caleb Pang in day number two? I mean, I feel like I had to bring the A plus game, because I think I got a rematch against Rubik's Master right off the bat, and uh, he really handled me pretty well there in that two and O against me. So I'm gonna have to figure out how to do it, or I just end day two a little early. That's fine with me too, but I'm um, just happy to be here and put on a show. Absolutely, and definitely some tough competition, as you mentioned, but something that I really admire is a lot of people will bring Pokemon that they think are necessarily the best. You've been very consistent in the fact. Bastiodon is one of my favorites. I will bring Bastiodon. Granted, didn't make an appearance in this particular set, but again, top cutting with Bastiodon, proving that oftentimes bringing a good team helps, but sometimes knowing how to play Pokemon can be even more impactful. Yeah, and I gotta say, Bastion today has a 100% win rate. I won't disclose how many times I used it, but just know that I haven't lost with it yet. You know what, 100% win rate, we will happily take that as well. And then, as you mentioned, yeah, the, the, the catch there in that game number two, proving to be very, very game impacting. And yeah, just very nicely done. And then I do want to commend the sportsmanship of Beach as well in that game number one, when it came down to that end game where he had those two charge attacks, being able to KO the Azumarill, Gligar not being able to get that charge move. But after the review, just, I, I kind of just want to talk to you about that. And that moment of obviously we're all here trying to win, but sportsmanship is the name of the game here in Portland. And uh, big props to Beach for that. Yeah, definitely. A big shout out to Beach to my opponent. Um, after we, you know, looked at the gameplay, it was probably a situation where my Gligar should have got that move off first. He conceded it. So he could have just gone for the rematch uh, and we just replay it. But a uh, really great sportsmanship from him. And, you know, we see him around circuit a lot. So looking forward to see more of Beach in action later this year. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me, Caleb. Congrats again. Day number two, again and again with the Bastion on. And I believe that we're going to close things out today by taking it over to the lounge. I believe we have Butters and Sovtov joining us over there to close out the show. And so. Welcome back, Pokemon trainers. My name is Home Slice Henry, joined here in the booth by the one and only Alpha Phoebe. We are in day two of Portland, and we've had some amazing matches so far, and we have an absolutely incredible rematch coming up here, Phoebe. Yeah, it's going to be Rubik's Master versus Caleb Peng. This is not the first time they've faced off in this tournament. It will be the second time. A bit of a grudge match. It is the final losers finals of the group stage. Afterwards, we will transition into our top eight. Absolutely. And previously, when these two trainers match up, Rubik's Master was able to get the two to zero victory. But these trainers have had all night to think about the rematch, study the footage, develop new game plans, make adjustments as necessary here. And these are two incredibly good trainers. Both have qualified for Worlds previously. So with a night of preparation under their belt, we should be in for some amazing matches, Phoebe. Very fair. It looks like the trainers are ready on the stage. Rubik's Master versus Caleb. 
And let's go through these teams once again, Feeb, starting with Rubik's Master. It's going to be Cresselia, Shadow, Alolan, Sandslash, Azumarill, Registeel, Trevenant, and Mandibuzz. It's going to be one of the only Trevenants that we see here. Also, double Shadow Claw on both that Sandslash as well as Trevenant. And I believe maybe one of two Mandibuzzes that we have in day two. Definitely, and Mandibuzz, a very interesting choice. We've definitely seen a bit of a debate here in terms of which flyer is going to be preferred. We've seen a lot of Gligar, we've seen a lot of Skarmory, and a couple trainers making the case for Mandibuzz as well. So Rubik's Master taking a look at the team. The Cresselia is running Future Sight instead of Moonblast. As you had mentioned, the dual Shadow Claw users, the Shadow Alolan Sandslash with the Legacy Shadow Claw, the Trevenant, the Azumarill, no Hydro Pump, the Registeel, and the Mandibuzz on Snarl, Aerial Ace, and the slightly harder are hitting Dark Pulse instead of the foul play. I'd also be curious to know if Rubik's Master is happy with his choice on that Mandibuzz. Would he have preferred maybe Aerial Ace or Foul Play for faster pacing uh, in terms of uh, foul play or maybe heavier hitting damage in terms of that uh, uh, um, air Slash, excuse me. On the other side of the table is going to be Caleb Peng. It's going to be Azumarill, Bastidon, Lickitung, very bulky Pokemon, followed by Shadow Gligar, Charger Bug, and Shadow Polyrath, running that standard counter Icy Wind Scald moveset. Will we continue to see uh, Scald debuffs not make an appearance, or will Caleb maybe have the luck on his side this morning? It's going to be a great match uh, as our two players are still locking in. And also the question will be, will Caleb in this day number two turn to the signature Pokemon of Bastiodon? He has brought it before. At this point, Caleb Peng is synonymous with Bastiodon Hoffman in a game number one, and there it is! Bastiodon finds its target in the Mandibuzz! And it's not a really great spot for Rubik's Master because he has two Pokemon on his team that aren't going to be great. The Trevenant is not an amazing answer for Bastiodon as well. We see that Caleb does not have a great answer to the Shadow Alone Sandslash. Did not be being Polyrath into this team, and we've talked about it a lot. A, a lot. So safe swapping, something that is double weak to counter, is so risky, and here it seems to maybe have paid off for Rubik's Master. We do see Caleb going for the X Scissor Bait here. This will not be enough damage to knock out. Decision point in the match for Rubik's. Rubik's is going to be shielding up that X Scissor Bait. That is a slightly consequential choice. Getting to this next drill run, will Caleb decide to shield here? It is going to be two shields used for Caleb, but recognizing that Bastidon versus Mandibuzz is a extremely dominant matchup. Now going for another X Scissor at this point. These Volt Switches have continued to add up on the Alolan Sandslash. Sandslash is going to double shield, understanding that switch advantage. Going up against something like Bastidon is very important. It's charge attack priority, and this drill run needs to knock out for Rubik's Master to take switch. I think it's going to be just a, uh, not enough, actually. I was going to say not uh, it's just enough damage, but not enough damage. Caleb Peng able to hold on to switch advantage with Charger Bug. That neutral damage, not super effective because of that bug subtyping Charger Bug has, means that it's not enough to knock out. Trevenant now coming in, getting a bit of an energy advantage, which will be helpful. However, Gligar, even though it's the Shadow Valiant, I believe will be able to hang on after a Shadow Ball lands. The question is, will Rubik's Master maybe be able to catch an Aerial Ace on that Mandibuzz, which really does not have a great place to go with Bastidon still on the bench for Caleb Penn. And we do see the Aerial Ace thrown by the Gligar. No protect shield left for the Trevenant. And there's nothing left to save the Mandibuzz from the Bastiodon. In comes the Bastiodon. The Smackdown's absolutely tearing through the Mandibuzz. And Caleb, the decision to bring the signature Pokemon works out amazingly in game number one. If my memory is serving me correctly, in the matchup against Rubik's Master day number one, I don't think he brought it, and I think he ended up losing 2-0, securing himself the first win. We see Rubik's Master maybe doing something, uh, a little a little bit of a joke across the table, recognizing that there is no way out of this matchup. Completely undercharges the aerial ace to do uh, maybe one or two damage to that Bastion. It's kind of hard to tell. You would like to see the, uh, the competitors having fun with it. Smiles across the board, and that's just an acknowledgement that the game is in fact over. But what a bold choice by Caleb Peng, choosing to bring that Bastion into a team that does have a Registeel, getting the lead call correct. Getting two X Scissors shielded in the mid game, preserving switch advantage, and the Bastiodon absolutely inevitable against that Mandibuzz. Better lead here into game number two. Shadow Alolan Sandslash into Bastiodon. I think Caleb might play this out. I think Bastiodon 
can hold on, maybe tries to catch a drill run at some point, but actually staying in, drill run coming through, but see if Caleb decides to shield this charge attack. This is double super effective damage onto that Bastion, the no shield, that does big damage, but Bastion is extremely bulky, able to withstand the damage and make it to the double super effective flamethrower. Yes, this flamethrower will be enough to knock out Bastion, able to comfortably win this zero shield matchup here. Shield comes up from Rubik's Master, a quick swap into the charge bug met by Trevenant. Trevenant now able to avoid that matchup against Bastion, but we don't really see a great answer for Rubik's Master in the back if he realigns that Shadow Alone and Sand Slash with that Bastion for Gligar. Gligar looks really free for Caleb if he gets the uh, if Rubik's Master gets the alignment incorrect. And we do see the Shadow Ball being fired off by the Trevenant here. Caleb is going to use the Protect Shield, and that is a big shield, as Charge Bug does have the pacing advantage here, fires off the x Scissor, and Caleb Peng has been able to win Switch Advantage. Switch Advantage is going to be key if Rubik's Master reveals his third Pokemon, Registeel. Registeel not having a very good matchup against Shadow Gligar. Both of its charge attacks will be resisted, doing about the same damage. In comes Registeel, so it has been revealed Caleb Peng now knows that he needs to keep the Gligar away from uh, this Registeel. However, it looks like, uh, not away from the Registeel, away from the Shadow Alone Sand Slash. However, it looks like Caleb was looking to potentially swap in the Gligar, which would allow Rubik's Master to switch in the Shadow Alone Sand Slash and regain that lineman and comes in with almost two Ice Punches loaded. And I think this is going to do a massive amount of double super effective damage to the Shadow Gligar. And this is where the energy management by Rubik's Master storing that energy earlier is going to come in clutch as Ice Punch number two is thrown. Caleb maybe not anticipating just how much energy was stored on the Sand Slash. No shields remaining for the Gligar. That's a one hit KO and Gligar goes down losing quite a lot of energy. It's a tough spot. His team of three did not have an amazing answer for Registeel in the two Pokemon that had been on the field already. Bastidon and Charger Bug both really not able to hit back Registeel for hard hitting damage. Even the super effective flamethrower does, I think, about 40% health to 40% uh, damage to that health of that Registeel. And we do see the discharge fired off here by the charge bug. The final shield going to be used by Rubik's Master. Rubik's Master continuing to farm up here. Can he get the farm down? He does! The charge bug unable to make it to a move and no shields remaining for the Bastion. Rubik's Master got farmed down by the Bastion in game number one, but it's Reggie Steele's revenge to even the series in game number two. A really great transition into game number two for Rubik's Master, bringing the Registeel, getting the alignment. Caleb Penn maybe making a bit of a misstep with bringing in that Gligar, underestimating the Shadow Alolan Sand Slash's energy, only having one shield remaining for those two nearly loaded Ice Punches. It was a lot to overcome there. And this is his best and worst placement is second for Rubik's Master. It's uh, honestly a really great place to be. You know, <laughs> second place is really not that bad. Caleb Penn, just some guy with a podcast, you know. Maybe maybe check it out if you'd like. We are going into game number three. This is not a great lead for Rubik's Master. He's transitioned from bad lead to good lead to bad lead. Registeel into Shadow Gligar. However, the Trevenant in the back is going to be able to avoid this matchup, but Lickitung lurks in the back for Caleb Penn. Yeah, this, this is definitely some difficult alignment here with that Trevenant also being weak to the Gligar. Rubik's Master in a very difficult position here. The Dig will connect. That does massive super effective damage, and both charge attacks here by the Ready Steel are going to be single resisted by the Shadow Gligar and only going to do about 40 to 45% of its HP. The question is now for me, does Rubik's Master decide to try to pivot to catch one of the Digs onto one of his two Pokemon in the back that take resisted damage. An attempted catch, no throw by Caleb Peck, pivoting in the Charger Bug to answer the Mandibuzz. And that is very unfortunate for Rubik's Master there, trying to go for the catch, but the patience by Caleb Peng to hold on to the energy, firing off the Dark Pulse, and here's where we talked about the difference between Dark Pulse and Foul Play. The Dark Pulse will add up quite a bit onto this Charger Bug. We see optimal timing from Caleb Peng there, throwing two Volt Switches. I think Rubik's Master maybe could have made Caleb's life a little bit more uncomfortable by throwing before that second Volt Switch came through so that Caleb would have had to overfarm in order to throw on optimal timing. However, Throwing this next uh, Dark Pulse, going to threaten a shield away from Caleb Peng, recognizing that he wants to maintain that alignment of Gligar onto Registeel. 
You see the continual farming by the Mandibuzz. Can't quite get to the Dark Pulse. One single turn short. And this Discharge is going to be doing quite a lot of damage to the Mandibuzz. Doesn't pick up the knockout. No, the Mandibuzz is too bulky. Able to withstand that damage. Go for another Dark Pulse. And this will be no shielded by Caleb Pang. It's really great game knowledge by Rubik's Master there. If he had thrown a Snarl, he would have taken the damage from that Volt Switch and not been able to get that uh, energy usage there. Rubik's Master going to now have to take Take this discharge. Unfortunately, I don't think he's going. He's going to opt for the shield. Not able to get the farm down, but he's unfortunately going to meet Lickatung in the back, and that is going to spell disaster for Rubik's Master. Seabon is neutral. However, it's not going to be enough damage to make it through this thick Lickatung. And we do see the adjustment here by Caleb. He led Bastion on those first two games. So Rubik's Master brought the Registeel, but instead it meets the Gligar. Gligar, a massive core breaker to this team. And now Trevenant, it didn't have to deal with the Gligar, but there's the secondary counter of Lickitung in the back. These seed bombs beginning to add up. But if you're Caleb, I mean, the lick damage here is just tearing through the HP of the Trevenant. Yeah, in comes the power rip. This is resisted damage, but is going to be more effective than the those body slams, able to very, not actually opting for the lick down, I thought he was going to, but body slam is going to be thrown, honestly, with the amount of health that's left on Caleb Peng's remaining Pokemon, I think he can quite candidly, uh, comfortably handle the rest of this Registeel. The Registeel does have 100 energy now, throwing the Focus Blast, which would pull the shield from the Lickitung, but instead opting to save it for the Gligar later. Gligar still has a bit of energy, will be able to throw a super effective dig into the Registeel if it so chooses. Back in comes the Gligar. The dig is loaded, and this is going to be a two-to-one victory for Caleb Pang, as he is going to advance into Top Cut here in the top eight. A bit of revenge for Caleb, getting victory over the person who knocked him down into the loser's side of the bracket. Really great adjustments there from both trainers, from game one to game two to game three. They both recognized the Pokemon that they needed to bring in order to overcome their uh, their opponent's team's composition. Bringing in Registeel, game number two was Rubix, and in game number three, to answer that Registeel, Caleb brought in Gligar. Thank you so much, and congratulations to Caleb Pang for getting Top Cut while actually using the Bastiodon. How do you feel, Caleb? I feel on top of the world. It feels amazing, you know? Uh, Rui Master was definitely one of the toughest bones I've ever faced, and uh, definitely slept on our matchup a little bit. And looking back on it, Bastion's pretty good. It beats like five out of his six in zero shield, so I decided to bring it in, and uh, it worked out quite well. Yeah, you were able to take that bench pressure to actually be pressure inside the battlefield, and you split those games with Bastionons. But that crucial game number three, you decided not to bring it. Why did you decide to do that? Yeah, so I think uh, coming into the set, I was ready, had my first, uh, all, all three lines pretty much planned out. If I make it a game three, I'm just gonna drop the Bastion. You know, uh, it did already did its work, got me that one game win, and I figured. It was enough to scare him to bring the Registeel again, and uh, Lickitung just proved to be a little too useful in the back. Yeah, Charger Boy was looking really strong against that team, and you knew that Trevenant had to be out there, so you put the Lickitung in the back, so that was a fantastic call from you, Caleb. How are you feeling going into the rest of the tournament? I believe you just told me you only prepared for this first matchup. How are you feeling going the rest of the way? Yeah, I mean, I was ready to just go 0-2 again against Rui's Master and head home, which is fine because uh, I have a flight to catch, but I'm totally down to rebook my flight so I make it any further. I don't know who I'm playing next, but uh, I'll figure it out when I sit down. If Phoebe wanted to ask this question earlier, how many scrims did you do preparing for this matchup? Because remember, this is a unique opportunity where yesterday you lost the matchup, and usually when you have rematches, it's, not, it's on the same day. It's not the day after. So how did you prepare for this rematch today? Yeah, uh, great question. So, um, big shout out to my podcast co-host Anacor, uh, as well as my Timmy, uh, my teammate Kimmy Sui, uh, who did some scrims. I only did two sets of three, um, but I got a lot of insights actually from LNDS Hard Jeff as well. He gave me some words of wisdom and some encouragement. So, uh, big shout out to them to help me prep for this because that's pretty much all I did. I just prepped for this one match and that was it. Well, big shout out to you, Caleb, and big shout out to Bastian. I know we probably won't see it that much later on, but good luck the rest of the way, my friend.
Back to you, Casters. The moment was absolutely perfect, but he has had some entertaining games for sure. But now we have another amazing matchup. We have Kayla Pang, of course, a two-time Worlds qualifier last season, but both times he was the runner-up in his regionals versus Onion Frank, the number two seed in this tournament in multiple top cuts, but I believe he hasn't made it all the way to a grand finals before. I think that's right. I think his highest placement last season came with a third place finish. So like you said, hasn't made it to grand finals, but has made a lot of these top cuts here. I feel like we usually see Onion come in on the winner's side here, so it's going to be a long road for him in these losers rounds. But like you said, number two seed, extremely experienced player. By the way, has even qualified for Worlds before in TCG. So really just oh, wow. an incredible Pokemon player all around. Wow, that's interesting. I did not know that about Onion Frank. But one thing I do know is Caleb Pang and Onion Frank have not battled each other. But I know for a fact that Caleb Pang has watched Onion Frank battle a lot of times because of course Caleb Pang is a commentator for the championship series. Oftentimes I'm sitting next to him and we are watching Onion Frank battle. And I, I know for a fact he has watched Onion Frank battle over five different series, probably more like 10 or 15 <laughs> because Onion Frank has made so many top cuts. So Caleb hasn't battled Onion Frank, but he's much more aware of Onion Frank's game than Onion Frank is aware of Caleb's game, in my opinion. Well, Caleb is a content creator, so Onion potentially having a lot of opportunities to watch Caleb. And I know he was watching Caleb earlier today, but let's get into this first game. Caleb's got a lead Lickitung into Skarmory. And this is not the greatest lead, but it's not terrible. And the swap into the Azumarill met by the Charge Bug here, but this does open up his Polyrath in the back. Looks like he was trying to bait out that Charge Bug with the Azumarill so that his Polyrath could have an easier time in the back. And this is something we see a lot from Caleb. He loves those ABB team compositions. Like we said, baiting out the Charge Bug, one bubble and throwing perfect timing, and you know, just trying to do as much damage with this Azumarill as possible, probably then going to absorb the Charge Bug's energy on Lickitung and then come with that Polyrath and see what it can do. And here comes the next Discharge right before the Ice Beam or Play Rough is available. And it's going to be not easy to counter down with the Polyrath, so you have to assume after... Oh, wait a second. He actually protects shields on the Azumarill and doesn't throw the bubble, just throws the Ice Beam without throwing the bubble first and trying to get shields down because I think he wants shields down for his Shadow Polyrath. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, because Caleb might be potentially thinking that they're, and thinking correctly, by the way, that there's a Gligar in the back. And in that case, Polyrath definitely needs shields down, but Onion also recognizing maybe switch advantage is kind of important. I'm going to go ahead and shield my own Charge Bug. I got that entire Volt switch as well. Throws the Excisor here, and that's a nice chip damage on the Lick Chunk, but Caleb comes in right oh, away with that wow. Polyrath. That was so risky there. And remember, he didn't throw a bubble earlier against that charge bug. And if that didn't pay off and the discharge was available, that would have been a huge mistake. But now he's matched up against Shadow Gligar. And Shadow Gligar can't take this matchup, but it's charge attack priority here. And Onion Frank knows he needs the protect shield. If you let that go, it's going to be a one hit knockout. Here comes the protect shield. And I think that's a great shield from Onion Frank. Does get that charge attack priority off. And the great thing is for Onion that once this Polyrath is out of the way, the charge attacks from that Lickitung are really not threatening. Actually, Caleb letting his Polyrath go here. How is he planning to take out the Skarmory? I, I don't know, but he has to take out two Flying-type Pokemons with this Lickitung. I know Lickitung is really good. Probably the best Pokemon in the meta just because of, of its, consistency, its consistency, its safety, and its bulk. But it's not a closer. I don't know how it's going to be able to get through this Gligar and get through a Skarmory. Lickitung, incredibly safe, but like you said, doesn't really have the pressure of those charge attacks that you need to close out the game. A lot of the time, you think about Pokemon like Cresselia, like Registeel, that have these really hard-hitting charge attacks. Lickitung, just, you know, if you come out of this with energy, what's that going to hit? A Skarmory? No. <laughs> I think that is unfortunately not going to be a good victory for this Lickitung. And let's the dig go, and here comes the Skarmory. The Skarmory is going to easily steal him down, and Onion Frank takes that game number one very comfortably comfortably against Caleb Pang here. And no Bastion on game number one for Caleb Pang. Uh, I don't feel like there's a great spot for Bastion against Onion Frank's team because you have double ground in that Wizcash, Shadow Gligar, and then the Vigoroth as well. The Bastion on, he brings it out when his back is against the wall. He brings his favorite Pokemon and it's leading versus Charger Bug. But guess what? Onion Frank's ABA weak to Bastion.
it on so he can't even swap out. And we did not see this coming. We were just talking about how we didn't think the Bastion was coming, come. And here it is exactly where he wants it against this charge bug. You know, Onion Frank has the Vigoroth in the back, which has a great matchup. Skarmory with that Steel Wing is certainly better than it was before, but not a great matchup still because of that resisted charge attack pressure. I think he's just going to smack <laughs> smack down this charger bug. I don't even think he's going to throw a stone edge. No, does decide to throw a stone edge. He could have thrown it before that discharge and could have saved some health on that Bastion. I'm not sure how valuable that is or if you're worried about having too much health because if you get countered down, instant pivot into the Azumarill and the Vigoroth is just staying in here and this looks like a really strong team composition adjustment from Caleb Pang. What a read from Caleb. You know, unfortunately for Onion Frank, Charger Buck was his only Azumarill answer. So Caleb, you know, noticing that Onion Frank had to stay in that lead matchup, noticing the uh, usefulness potential that Bastion would have in the back, I think that's why he's preserving the health and why he's preserving that Bastion now by bringing in this Azumarill. You're exactly correct because you could feel that the opponent is ABA weak to that Bastion. And of course, Caleb Pang is a Bastion expert. He knows that that can be useful even at such a low health against the other thing that will be weak to Bastion, either a Skarmory or maybe he thinks it's a Shadow Dragonair. Either way, it's going to be valuable. This looks like it was charge attack priority between that Body Slam and Ice Beam. And here comes a Protect Shield from the Azumarill. Yeah, Body Slam typically doesn't do a lot of damage to Azumarill, but again, Caleb has that extremely bulky Bastion in the back typically doesn't need Protect Shields. Azumarill, like we said, extremely flexible against Onion Frank's team. Actually, uh, shielding up this uh, Vigoroth Oh, simultaneous here. swap, though. That's huge. So that means you're pacing to the Scald at the same time as Sky Attack. If you didn't simultaneously swap, you would be down energy against the Skarmory, and then the Skarmory could outpace, and Onion Frank identifies it and just lets the Scald go. Caleb, definitely on top of these swaps, not giving Onion any room to breathe here, even with that huge, huge advantage that Caleb got off the lead matchup. And Caleb is a trainer that's not afraid to pivot, even with a Bastion on team. He will often pivot straight away, try to keep Pokemon at low health for the end game, and then just try to find little advantages. And this was a huge advantage in this game because that is a three ball flex from Caleb Pang. He has three Pokemon remaining and he ties up this series one to one. My goodness, Caleb having the gall to bring that Bastion on. You know, we talked a little bit earlier yesterday about Onion Frank changing up his strategy, you know, kind of based on the tournament structure. We know he used to be a very alignment based player, often bring Pokemon such as the Bastion or Shadow Victory Bell even. But think about Caleb. He's changed a lot too. He used to almost never bring Bastion on except, you know, maybe in a hopeless game five situation. But here he is. He brought it so much against Rubik's Master and even had the bravery to bring it into this Whizcash Gligar Vigoroth team here. Yeah, Gligar, and there's no Bastion in the back, and there's a Lickitung in the back. So now Onion Frank has a chance to get that alignment. He actually doesn't really have a clear swap in. He shakes his head and stays in with Skarmory. And he doesn't have an answer. Remember, his only answer on the entire team of 6 4 Azumarill is that Charge Bug, and he didn't bring it here, so not going to be really able to capitalize as much off of that good lead. But we'll see what he decides to do. Maybe you stay in and throw a Brave Bird before swapping. It looks like that's what he's going. For. And if he maintains alignment here, and if he matches up Big Roth into Lickitung, this is going to be so tough for Caleb here, lands that Brave Bird, but then swaps into the Vigoroth here, and now the Vigoroth has an opportunity to just body slam and counter down, so that Brave Bird chip and dip is gonna be really useful to maintain alignment. But so, here's the Vigoroth. This was the worst case scenario for the Lickitung in the back, but you baited it out. Now the Vigoroth has a lot of play into this team, but it's not gonna see the Lickitung, and instead, we're gonna end up seeing that Whiz Cash on the Lickitung late game. Again, that matchup isn't bad without shields, but late game, there aren't gonna be many shields in play. Yeah and it's going to be the Whizcash versus that Lickitung. And the thing is, how do you finish off this Skarmory as well? Because in the back, you're so weak to that Skarmory. You have Shadow Gligar and you have Lickitung remaining. It's going to be really tough to even do damage against the Skarmory. As you land this Body Slam, you're going to get to one more Body Slam and this is going to do so much damage, it's going to be hard to even Wing Attack down. I think Caleb's formula to taking out that Skarmory is just going to be with those licks. The good news is because that Azumarill was able to land a move on that Skarmory. It's only at half health. Caleb forced to throw a charge attack oh. here. Doesn't want to take another body slam, it looks like. Yeah, it looks like he didn't want to put himself too low, so he couldn't throw a charge attack or get knocked out by 
that counter or let a body slam go through. Here comes double pivot, and here comes the whiz cash. And Onion Frank's kind of shaking his head a little bit. He's just reaching for that skull debuff. And if he doesn't land this skull debuff, that gives a lot of play for the power whip to one hit knock out. And can he land it? Here comes the protect shield. Will the coin flip and Onion Frank flavor? No! Doesn't get it. Is going to have to shield at this first move unless he wants to call this body slam from Caleb. It's kind of an odd. Oh, oh my he goodness, calls he calls it. it! He calls the body slam bait and it shakes his head knowing that that was coming. And that could have been Caleb's opportunity to land a, a power whip in between two protect shields, but it doesn't happen. And that could have been game for Caleb taking out this whiz cash and then having enough help on that Lickitung to take out the Skyrim, but he's not out of it yet. He still needs to land another charge attack on this whiz cash. And here comes the decision from Onion Frank to use a protect shield. There comes a the protect shield onto the body slam. Looks like Caleb at this point will just go straight body slam here. And the, the Skarmory is less than half health, so you can take it down eventually. Do you go for the body slam before the Scald? Do you try to swap on a Scald here? Can you get the last protect shield? Now Onion Frank suddenly out of protect shields. Out of protect shields, but like you said, still has that Skarmory. Looks like Caleb is going for the combo play, but anticipated by Onion Frank. Look at that, catching this aerial ace onto the Skarmory. Great anticipation all game from Onion Frank, and now it's a resistant aerial ace, knowing that was going to be incoming into that Whizcash, and now he can get that Steel Wing down, and there's only one Protect Shield remaining for the Lickitung. Your only chance is to what? Lick this down, or you have to Protect Shield here. Lick down and power up the Whizcash. Yes, lick down and power up the Whizcash, but how much energy does Whizcash have? Does that Whizcash have a attack banked here? You will definitely get this lick down, but you won't get to the power whip. You're oh. one lick away. Is there attack already available? And no, the power whip comes first. No way! The power whip is coming out here. This power whip is definitely going to knock out the Whizcash to Caleb out of nowhere. Takes down Onion Frank. Lickitung really powering through the end of that game. And it looks like Onion Frank actually may have a, a Skulls loaded at the end there. Was that before the charge move came through or what? did he just get the energy for that? He went for a mud shot when he had Scald. I don't know if he already had and if he went for two mud shots, we could slow down the end of game number three, the very end, Lickitung versus Whizcash. We can look at that again to see if the move was already banked. Because if the attack was already banked, you throw the Scald. What right. are you messing around with a mud shot? for, you can just win the game and move on in this loser side of the bracket. So I'm actually fascinated to see if Onion had the skull loaded or not. Yeah, Caleb really pulling that win out of nowhere. We were thinking, how is going to take out the Skarmory? How is going to take out this Whizcash? After Onion called that body slam bait, it looked pretty much over for Caleb. Yeah, exactly. That was his win condition, maybe. And Onion Frank was confident. He shook his head knowing that body slam would be coming through. And we thought that was the winning decision from Onion Frank. But Lickitung, out of nowhere, maybe you actually don't want to throw the Brave Bird there, too. Because then you could have maybe gone to double Sky Attack. Because uh, yeah, you lower your defense and give the perk perfect fast attack window. Sky attack, oh, we don't see that there. And the Skull was ready. The Skull was ready. He didn't go for it. He went for a mud shot. He went for a mud shot there. I'm not sure why he went for the mud shot, but the Skull was available. And Skull, it looks like Lickitung was in Skull range. Right. I'm, I know Lickitung's bulky. Whizcash doesn't have the most attack, but I think it was in Skull range. I think it was, and I think that was actually Onion's plan, right? He throws the Brave Bird, gets that last shield. He knows that the um, Steel Wings are going to be just enough to put it into Skull's range. I think he might have gone for the Brave Bird, hoping that that would give the Lickitung a little bit less farm, right? Yes. So it couldn't come out with a power, but it ended up being the perfect amount of farm. Yeah. <laughs> Let's focus back on the stage. Our players are ready as we continue through this tournament. Returning to the stage are both Leo, Geo, and Caleb Peng. Faces we've seen a number of times before, and you and I are living our best lives. It is <laughs> going to be another Skeledurge gaming set. Skeledurge, Azumarill, Defense Form, Deoxys, Registeel, Wishcash, and Lickitung. We were talking a lot, you and I, backstage in that last set about how I think Bopper maybe would have preferred to have Vigoroth on his team instead of Defense Form Deoxys. We'll have to see if Leo Geo is forced into similar positions here in this matchup against Caleb. Absolutely. And for Caleb, we already know about the Bastiodon. The Bastiodon has definitely made its presence felt here in day number two. And adding to that Bastiodon is going to be the Azumarill, that Lickitung, the Shadow Gligar, the Chargebug, and that Shadow Polyrath. So again, a little bit of a difference in terms of counter users. The Polyrath for Caleb, and of course, as we see here, that Defense Deoxys with Thunderbolt for Leo Geo. And that Defense Form Deoxys is going to be running Psycho Boost and Thunderbolt so it can fight back against 
Caleb Peng's Azumarill and uh, the Skeledurge on the standard set there with Incinerate, uh, Incinerate, Shadow Ball, and Disarming Voice on the other side is going to be Caleb's team. We've seen it before, standard sets all around. Azumarill opting for dropping Hydro Pump so he has the Ice and Fairy coverage, which means that Skeledurge feels a little bit more comfortable in that matchup. We've talked a lot about Skeledurge and without access to Hydro Pump, Azumarill doesn't have any really threatening charge attacks. Very true. And it looks like we do have a lock-in here for game number one. Leo Geo versus Caleb Pang. And the Bastionon returns to the field, and it finds a target in Lickitung. And looking at these teams, Leo Geo seems in a very strong position. Oh, this might not be the lead that he wants to see. In the back, he has Defense Form, Deoxys, and Azumarill. Both Pokemon looking to potentially not line up against Caleb Pang's Shadow Polyrath. A really dominating position team composition wise but he might not feel that right now because he's currently in a matchup and has no idea what Caleb has in the back absolutely the Lickitung into the Bastion on matchup is a difficult one for the Lickitung as the combination of the Smackdown and the Stone Edge damage is continuing to add up whereas Lickitung is forced to go for the non same type attack bonus move we see the save switch into the defense Deoxys and that's going to be answered by Gligar yeah but I was talking about how maybe Leo Geo would want the Groth, but here Caleb Peng has a counter user in the back, so forced to swap in the Gligar. Thunderbolt goes no shielded. Caleb Peng recognizing if this is a Psycho Boost, he's going to lower his lower his attack. So I really don't mind if it is a Thunderbolt or a Psycho Boost at this moment in time. Going for the dig, this is going to do a lot of good neutral damage. Leo Geo not being threatened a knockout yet, actually reaching for the Psycho Boost at this point. It's going to be a lot of good same type attack bonus, neutral damage. Damage, pulling Caleb Peng's first shield. Grabbing the shield here is quite nice for Leo Geo. The Gligar is going to be hit with another move if it tries to go for the farm down, and Caleb knows that. Firing off this aerial ace just before Leo Geo is able to make it to a minus two attack psycho boost. I might have preferred to see in a full farm down because the energy would have been pretty solid into Leo Geo's Lickitung. It's still not wasted here against the Azumarill. Dig going to do a nice little bit of a chunk. The question becomes, does Leo Geo opt for a full bump? Double down. At this point, actually, Caleb's looking really strong. The the, the Bastiodon, no longer paired up against the Lickitung, is going to have a really solid time against this, this Azumarill that has no access to Hydro Pump. And we are going to see the full farm down here from the Azumarill, but this is where not having Hydro Pump could be a bit of a problem, as in comes the Bastiodon. This is not a type advantage matchup, but due to that Ice Beam Play Rough moveset, the Bastiodon is a complete wall to charge moves from that Azumarill. The bubbles are super effective and do slightly more damage damage at this point, but Caleb Pengs, the, the, the Polyrath, it was in a awful position at the beginning. Azumarill in Defense Storm Deoxys, the two possible opponents later on. It's now going to be able to rematch itself up against Caleb, uh, against Leo Geo's Lickitung and get a massive farm down. And even though it's completely walled by the Azumarill, it's going to leave with almost an Icy Wind's worth of energy. He makes the body slam. This is not enough for the power whip. And the counting by Caleb, understanding this cannot be the power whip. We do see the no shield there. And the body slam, not very threatening. And now Polyrath gets to go for the Icy Wind. Leo Geo going for the no shield, conceding that this game number one has concluded. A bit unfortunate there, Leo Geo swapping out of that negative lead actually put him in a worse position later on, giving up his uh, theoretical alignment in the future. He would have had either of his back two Pokemon against that Polyrath, but Caleb recognizing, oh, I can now align my Polyrath onto that Lickitung, putting himself in a very positive position going forward. But here we go, game number two. We've got lock-in, we see Lickitung, and we see Shadow Gligar. Now this is a very neutral matchup, but Lickitung has a slight edge in that it has got significant bulk over the Gligar. We actually see an attempted catch of, I think, a Body Slam into the Charger Bug, but 
good patience by Leo Geo, still opting to throw this and deciding how he wants to play from here. His two Pokemon in the back don't want to see this Charger Bug, which is great for him. His two Pokemon in the back do want to see that Poliwrath, which he doesn't know about yet, but he's going to be very happy to see it later on. Absolutely. So this honestly worked out about the best that it could for Leo Geo, being very, very weak in the back to that Charger Bug. And we are going to see the Body Slam fired off here as the Volt Switch comes through for the Charger Bug. Body Slam landing, not going to threaten a knockout. It looks like one more Body Slam will do it, and I believe we are well outside of X's range. Caleb Penn recognizing that Charge Bug wins Charge Attack priority against that Lickitung throwing. At the same time, the Body Slam is reached. Body Slam, or <laughs> X's are not knocking out. Body Slam is going to come through as well. And this Lickitung has a little bit of health left for uh, a farm down from, I'm assuming, Caleb's Gligar so that he can get a bit more energy. And this Gligar, up a lot of energy, has not taken a lot of damage. And that energy, even if it is in a negative matchup, like going up against the Azumarill, this energy is still very threatening. We saw in game number one that Shadow Dig can do quite a lot of damage here. And now Caleb, despite the fact that he is pretty weak to the Azumarill in the back, has put himself in a position that he can potentially succeed with this massive, massive energy lead on this Gligar. Great call by Leo Geo, recognizing that the first charge attack is not likely going to be a bait. Opting the no shield the second one. Dig is going to do a good amount of neutral damage here. The question is, does Caleb decide to pivot after this to uh, avoid the bubble damage? Opting to stay in. Two more bubbles thrown by Leo Geo into the ice beam. This would be a knockout into the Shadow Gligar. Caleb opting the shield is going to stay in even longer, take more super effective bubbles. And you can see how much damage it's starting to add up to on the Gligar deep in, uh, just into the red. And we do see the no shield from the Azumarill. Dig will not be able to pick up a knockout, but it will get the Azumarill very low. In comes the switch into the Polyrath, and it's answered by the Defense Deoxys. And this Deoxys is running Thunderbolt, so it has two options for super effective damage against this Polyrath. Polyrath's counters are going to be resisted by the psychic typing of that defense form Deoxys. And look at how much damage those uh, that Skull does, putting that Defense Form Deoxys deep into the red. Psycho Boost coming through, trying to pace a bit quicker. Caleb opting to shield, recognizing if this is the Psycho Boost, it would do the most amount of damage. Back-to-back -back Psycho Boost thrown. We'll see exactly how much damage this reduced attack Psycho Boost does. The attack has been lowered to minus three, and it feels it. That's not enough to pick up the knockout here. Defense Deoxys continuing to farm. Caleb going for the Icy Wind here. An Icy Wind would pick up the knockout, Unless Leo Geo shields, but he is not. He's leaving it all up to Azumarill, but Azumarill is extremely low on HP. Very low on HP. Counter is a very solid move. Leo Geo throwing an Ice Beam at the same time as the Icy Wind comes through, and no shielding, recognizing that if he throws that energy, the Gligar would be able to get the wing attack down, and Caleb Peng in a worst case lineup scenario actually is able to win game number two and come out victorious. Fantastic energy management there from Caleb Pang. As you had mentioned, he didn't have the alignment that he was looking for. He was very, very weak to the Azumarill in the back, but the decision to bank energy on the Gligar send the Charge Bug into what is not an amazing matchup for it, but again, using that as, as an opportunity to get more and more farm. Exiting with a dig's worth of energy and not really much of any damage, so he could withstand those super effective bubbles, continue to apply more and more pressure onto the Azumarill, and then in the end game, that Shadow Polyrath, that sure did look like a bad matchup when he played it out there. That was some serious damage from that skull. I believe our next matchup is ready on the stage, and this is an absolute heavyweight bout here. Two incredible battlers, Roberto versus Caleb. And if I'm not mistaken, this is a rematch of the 2023 San Diego Regional Championship Finals. It is, and this is where both of those two trainers actually qualified for Worlds. Caleb opting to cast Worlds as opposed to participate, but Ramberto earning his qualification off of that championship win. And, oh my goodness, taking a look at the teams here, I cannot wait for this matchup. Roberto, of course, running the Vigoroth here, the Azumarill, the Skarmory, the Chargebug, the Whizcash, and the Shadow Gligar. And for Caleb, a different counter user of choice, that Shadow Polyrath. 
and it's gonna match up really well into Ramberto's Vigoroth, so we'll have to see how those two players play around that. The rest of Caleb's team is going to be that charge above that Gligar, Lickitung, Bastidon, and Azumarill. We saw it not too long ago. We'll see it again here. As it is very frequently with Bastidon, where will it line up? What Pokemon does it want to avoid? Obviously, it doesn't want to see the Wish Cash. It doesn't want to see the Vigoroth. The Azumarill here is on the Play Rough and Ice Beam set for Amberto, so that is a more neutral matchup than if that Azumarill was running Hydro Pump. Absolutely. And for Caleb here, Caleb, I believe it's now been a couple rounds in a row that he's felt very comfortable leading that Bastiodon in game number one. So the question will be, will the trend continue here? Does he continue to bring that Bastiodon lead? And it looks like down on the stage, the battlers are locked in. Game one, Caleb Pang versus Rumberto. Skarmory for Rumberto into the Bastiodon. There it is. In the back, we see both Azumarill and Gligar. A quick switch into the Gligar, pulling out the Azumarill. It would have been an interesting position if Ramberto had swapped in his Azumarill. The best answer Caleb would have had was his own Azumarill, because Gligar would be taking super effective damage from those bubbles, and he could theoretically stay in with the Bastiodon, but then he would no longer have the alignment of Bastiodon versus Skarmory. Absolutely. And the Gligar able to grab an early shield here, and we see Gligar shielding back Ramberto would love to try and make a play for switch advantage here, but Caleb has already shielded once and may look to expend resources here. He's actually gonna let this move through, but a future dig could be threatening. With the change to Bubble, you can see just how much better this matchup became for Azumarill. Very comfortably able to get the Gligar down deep into the yellow, almost into the red, just with this bubble damage. Both charge attacks have been shielded by Ramberto. The question now becomes, is he going to bait with Aerialist? He does bait for Aerialist here. This is not going to threaten a knockout, but if Caleb shields, maybe the next Aerialist after will be threatening a knockout. This will be incredibly close. Ramberto continues to farm. These bubbles are adding up, making it to the aerial ace. No, he does not get there. And Roberto is unable to flip switch advantage, which means the Skarmory will be stuck against the Bastiodon. Yes, yeah, so I have to imagine that the Skarmory comes back in. But the one thing Roberto does have... Oh, actually, no, it's the Azumarill. Azumarill is going to be taking this play rough. This is good. Neutral damage will do maybe about 20% of the health of that Azumarill. The, the trouble is is that Ramberto's energy here that he's go, uh, getting won't be very useful. I think Caleb could honestly bring in either the Gligar or the Bastiodon. It doesn't matter if the Gligar gets taken out because Bastiodon is in such a great spot. No super effective charge attacks coming from Azumarill. We do actually see that he's putting it all on Bastiodon. I don't actually expect Caleb to bring that Gligar back in for the rest of this game. <laughs> Absolutely, and Bastiodon is going to be able to withstand the play roughs here. We see the shake of the head for Roberto firing off this play rough. The play rough connects, but again, not having that Hydro Pump is proving to be game impacting here in this game number one. Great counting by Caleb, throwing this next Stone Edge before the next charge attack could be thrown by Roberto. I actually think this is going to be shy of picking up the knockout. The next play rough is going to be able to become through. I'm curious if Caleb will try to catch it on the Gligar. No. As I had predicted earlier, just staying in, taking this chip damage, it's going to put the Bastiodon deep into, or not deep into the yellow, barely into the yellow. But now, Skarmory comes in, and there's plenty of energy loaded on Caleb's Bastiodon. This Bastiodon looking incredibly threatening in this endgame. No shields remaining for the Skarmory. The Flamethrower connects, and that does quite a significant amount of damage. These Steel Wings do hit for neutral damage, but the Bastiodon, it's so close to another charge move, and it will get to a another flamethrower and this should just about do it here super effective flamethrower damage into the skarmory skarmory survives with a small amount of hp left it may be able to get the knockout onto the bastiodon but there's still a full health pokemon for caleb in the back we were talking about it uh, a bit earlier a long long time ago before skarmory ran stealing before 
Skarmory ran Brave Bird. You need a win to stay alive in this tournament. Game number two, looks like the battlers have reached a lock-in here. Yes, and locking in is Ramberto with Charger Bug into Caleb Peng's Shadow Polyrath, a positive lead. We see a switch out into Lugatung. This is gonna be hard answered by the Vigoroth. Caleb's thinking, okay, this is great. This Vigoroth's no longer going to be on my Bastion, but as long as Ramberto is able to maintain alignment, which it's gonna happen. It's gotta happen. Lickitung doing no damage with his fast attacks. The body slam's not adding up nearly enough. It's going to be a glider against that Bastiodon later on in this battle. Here's the thing though, don't count out Bastiodon. It is a ground type, but it has the flying subtyping, so it will be taking neutral damage here. But in the interim, we see Vigoroth continuing to farm. Caleb opting for the Power Whip here. Power Whip does do slightly more damage, but it is not going to be getting that same type of attack bonus. Yes, it's going to put the Vigoroth into the red. However, no damage being done by these licks. Vigoroth able to farm all the way down, come out with multiple body slams. I imagine it's going to be the Polyrath. Actually, he has options. He could come in with the Bastion if he wanted. It would reveal his third Pokemon, but these charge attacks would not do any damage. Instead, coming in with the Polyrath, getting the counter through, but I don't think it's going to be quite enough to pick up the knockout, and a second Body Slam is going to land. That second counter going through will pick up the knockout on this Vigoroth, but this damage is very meaningful. The Polyrath is deep into the red. And now in comes Gligar. I love that play, the anticipation. Polyrath would be switching no matter what. And now we have Bastiodon versus the Shadow Gligar, but importantly, the Shadow Gligar is not behind on energy. And we see surprise on Ramberto's face. He accidentally let a Smackdown through improper timing. It's always so hard when both trainers have switched. Sometimes it can feel a little bit off, a little bit clunky. Your counts might not be exactly perfect because that switch costs a turn for Caleb on his side. We see another dig is about to be reached from Ramberto's end. The first dig was shielded up. The second dig Will it get shielded? I think he has the opportunity to reach a third. And he will be able to reach a third before the second Stone Edge is thrown. And this is very important timing-wise. Switch Clock not up for Caleb Peng. This is double super effective damage. But in this matchup, Gligar has almost no fast move pressure. So this super double super effective move is survivable. And now we see the switch into the Charger Bug as Charger Bug needs to make a discharge to pick up a knockout. Stone Edge being thrown, shielded correctly by Ramberto. These charge attacks are super effective, in, even though Bastodon does not have a very high attack set. Ooh, Caleb going for the catch. Ramberto going for extra farm, knowing he needs two charge attacks anyways. Great patience from Ramberto, throwing the discharge now into the Bastodon. Bastodon's extremely bulky, but this is neutral damage and will be almost enough to knock out. And the Bolt Switch picks up the knockout. Caleb bringing the Bastion on in game number two, but Roberto has the answers and amazing patience in that end game there, understanding Caleb's win condition, expecting him to play for it. The pause there, not tapping the screen. Amazing, amazing prediction by Roberto. He gets the equalizer here. And like all good series do, we're going to a decisive game three, Phoebe. Will we see Caleb continue with that thought process, think, hey, I brought Bastion on twice. It didn't do its job in game number two. It did its job in game number one. I'm gonna leave it behind. Or will he stick with his gut, stick with his best friend and uh, bring it into game number three. It's a tough call, but it looks like we do have lock-ins here. Game number three, charge a bug into the Lickitung here. This is a slightly favorable lead for Caleb. And look what's in the bag, Phoebe. It is going to be the Bastiodon for Caleb Pang. And it looks like switch advantage will be important for Ramberto. It's maybe not quite as important for Caleb. As you said, Bastiodon versus Gligar, although double super effective digs do a lot of damage, it's able to withstand one and is able to hit back for neutral damage. We see the switch out. Ramberto catching a power whip on Azumarill? I believe may have wanted to try and catch a body slam there, but now this Azumarill not in a good alignment for it whatsoever as the Lickitung is able to stay in here, farm up quite a bit of energy, and he's going for a body slam bait at the no shield! The no shield by Rumberto! What a call! I actually don't like this bait from Kayla because I don't think Power Whip was quite at the point where it would have knocked out, so it's a more comfortable no shield from Rumberto. 
Caleb actually staying in this matchup, being comfortable with it, probably saying, hey, if we end up both using our shields here, I can maintain switch advantage and align my Bastion on that charge of and we do see now the shield from Roberto trying to potentially make a play for switch advantage, but this is a range where Body Slam will be able to get a knockout, and we do see the over farm by Roberto, and Caleb is able to grab that final shield. Roberto's a little bit over Ice Beam energy. I don't think he's actually going to be able to pace fast. Wait. He's one or two bubbles away now. I think that is all the difference. If he's one bubble away from the next Ice Beam, I think he will be able to win switch advantage. If he's two bubbles away, I think Caleb might re reach his next Body Slam. It's two bubbles. Bobby's Body Slam has just reached before Ramberto's able to reach that final Ice Beam. The tiniest of margins deciding switch advantage in this game. Lickitung able to win switch advantage. Back in comes that Charger Bug. Charger Bug farming down the Lickitung. But Charger Bug will not like what Caleb has in the back. In comes the Bastion on the Gligar, enters the field, and it's the Azumarill. No Protect Shields remaining for Roberto, so there is nothing to stop double super effective Ice Beam getting the knockout. This matchup looks a lot different if there are shields on both sides. The bubble damage, although it's super effective, does add up a little bit, but we see the one-hit knockout. Ice Beam, double super effective, and although this is a good matchup for Charger Bug, there's just absolutely no way that that Charger Bus could carry an entire Bastion on, on its way to school. Unfortunately not. Roberto understanding here that the game is over. There are no more win cons, and Caleb Peng able to get a little bit of revenge here for that San Diego Finals, able to take the win, and Caleb Bank continues a very impressive run here in the loser's bracket. Kobe has taken down so many players this tournament. Beach, Rubik's Master, and now he's got another huge giant in his way, and that's Caleb Peng. But if he can win this match, he's back into those grand finals for a rematch with Abinov. Beat Bopper and was one game away from being in that grand final, so it's been incredibly impressive from Kobe. And then Caleb Peng, of course, we know his journey. He has Plays second place two times in the San Diego Regional and then the Fresno Regional as well. And now he is trying to get back into those grand finals, but this time he wants to win it all here in Portland. And this is actually his first time coming in from that loser side of the bracket and what a run he's been on. I mean, you have to imagine he's incredibly warmed up right now, has all the momentum. I think he's already played on stream four times today, whereas Kobe, you know, coming in from the winner side, all of a sudden, this like that game just now, that was his first match loss of the entire tournament. And, you know, needs to pick it back up right now. And remember, the loser's bracket, we also had loser's finals to start today. And out of those loser's finals, to make top cut, it was It's Axon, Onion Frank, Caleb Pang, and Ramberto. And of course, Caleb Pang had to knock out Ramberto, who was responsible for a second place finish in San Diego. So he already got over that hurdle. Can he get over the final hurdle, get into these grand finals and win the entire thing? We all thought the story might be in that loser side of the bracket here in Portland and Caleb has that chance right now. And he is on such a run, but before I get to Caleb, let's take one last look at Kobe's team. He's got that double ground uh, core that we've seen so much in this tournament, Gligar and Whiskash. Note that he actually does have that regular Gligar, doesn't have the shadow of Gligar like a lot of other players here. And he's been using a lot of Cresselia as well, and he has told us in the past that Mandibuzz has been his MVP so far. Let's look how Mandibuzz will be against Caleb's team. And Caleb, of course, is running that Bastidon. And this is literally the first time ever I've seen him play a Bastidon for a complete series. He played it in all three games versus Ramberto, and he was able to win two to one. And that Bastidon was really important for Caleb's matchup against against Rubik's Master as well. You know, we talked about Caleb. He's been second place so many times. He wants that regional championship. And I think this is an adjustment he's made. That Bastiodon is no longer just bench pressure. It's actually coming into the games. And I think it's kind of getting into the opponent's heads a little bit. But I think they're actually locking in here for that very first game of Losers Finals. Let's see if Caleb tries to set a tone with the Bastiodon and bring it to game number one. And it is going to be the Wizard.
Miss Cash into Shadow Gligar as we get these losers finals on its way. And Shadow Gligar is going to stay in this matchup right now. Looks kind of like an ABB team for Caleb having two water types in the back. Does have that ABB and oh! here comes the pivot catching the Scalds here. But this is going to be important. If the Scalds debuffs the Azumarill, then Caleb is going to be locked in here for 50 more seconds while debuffed. And it doesn't grab that debuff, but at least you do get to bring in the Cresselia, which is going to have an easier time because of that Scald damage. I believe double Grass Knot plus Psycho Cuts, it's going to be able to knock out Azumarill. And usually, without that damage, you need a triple Grass Knot. So that might be pretty good for Kobe here. And I think that's going to be good, depending on how much these Psycho Cuts end up doing. Might even try to undercharge that last Grass Knot for a little bit of extra energy coming out. Like we said, Caleb Pang is known for playing these ABB lines has the double water and baits out, of course, the quote-unquote grass type Cresselia there. But Kobe looks like he was anticipating a little bit. Actually has a Gligar in the back as well. Yeah, he was anticipating maybe that Polyrath Azumarill backline. Like you mentioned, I feel like he has the perfect backline for it. He does have the normal Gligar, though. And the Shadow Polyrath, once you get the debuff on that normal Gligar, it can endure one Aerial Ace. And now the Play Rough is coming through. No Protect Shield. You will get this Cycle Cut down. So you will get a Charge Attack also on the next Pokemon. Which Pokemon you bring in the soak it. You're gonna have to soak a future site here unless you throw the dig, and there comes a dig from Caleb to deny the future site. Great counting by Caleb. That future site would have done a lot of damage. Kobe maybe debating. Oh, actually oh. thinks it's worth putting up a protect shield to get off this future site. I mean, that is going to do a lot of damage for sure. And he just didn't want to waste all that energy. Let that future site go down the drain. So he lands it. And the thing is, I don't think you can wing attack down before the grass knot is available. I think you will get to the grass knot last second. We're gonna see if he. Once again, Caleb throwing on charge attack priority to deny that. This time, Kobe doesn't want to use another protect shield. Let's the Cresselia go. Great counting by Caleb. And I also like the no shield of that future site. Remember, Caleb already saw that Wiz Cash. He knows that the Wiz Cash Scald is going to do more. But oh. Kobe actually going to Gligar. But now Caleb responding with the Polyrath. And that's tough, though, because you're swapping into this Polyrath. Or, sorry, into this Gligar. So this Polyrath is already going to be taking the full damage of these wing attacks before you can get that Icy Wind debuff up. And you, yes, you are up a protect shield, but how much are these fast attacks just going to weigh on you? I actually like that he throws on charge attack priority because that denies one wing attack from Kobe. That's right, and Kobe is going to be able to throw off this aerialist, but I think now, if I'm not mistaken, Polyrath has just a little bit of residual energy, might even be able to get to another Icy Wind on charge attack priority again. I think he might slightly get outpaced here, but you might be right. Will it be right on charge attack priority? I think you are close, and then there is the swap into the Whizcast trying to soak that Icy Wind, but soaks a, a Scald instead, and it looked like he tried to register charge attack priority on the Mud Bomb, but I'm not sure if it registered. I don't think that Mud Bomb quite registered. Kobe might just be about a half second behind, but throws out this Mud Bomb here. It is going to be just enough to take out this Polyrath. And then, of course, Caleb still has a little bit of that Gligar in the back. But I don't know if it has too much energy here. Almost had an Aerial Ace. Oh, gets the Swing Attack down, though. That's going to be huge. Yeah, that is huge. And I think you need the double here to be able to knock out, and you just can't get to the double. So Kobe is able to take Game one versus Caleb Pang. He just dropped two games straight to Abanov, but rebounds in this loser's finals. Shiny Gligar taking out that Shadow Gligar. Great play from Kobe there in the game one. I think read Caleb's team perfectly. Like you mentioned, Caleb bringing that ABB double water in the back, but Kobe responding with the Cresselia and the uh, other answer to the water in the back. Uh, read that line actually perfectly. Got the Gligar on the Polyrath in the end. So our two Pokemon kind of weak and Gligar a little more neutral, but can be it too so we don't see that basket on in this game number two and instead we see a bad lead for Caleb Pang. Yeah again the Cresselia is on the Azumarill this is exactly where Kobe wants the Cresselia uh, does have these super effective grass knots which as you mentioned doesn't quite two hit the Azumarill but comes very very close and potentially allows you a, a little bit of extra farm afterwards. This time it looks like the Shadow Polyrath does have a place to go in the back because if you see the back line from Kobe it is Registeel and Whizcash and if you have that protection shield advantage once again trying to swap maybe trying to catch a grass knot but was a little early on that grass knot so kobe could be patient and throw the future site here into the shadow gligar and actually throwing up, up a protect shield on the shadow gligar and this is so uncomfortable for kobe because how do you get rid of this gligar it's not quite in skull range maybe hoping that these psycho cuts add up 
enough for it to be in Skull's range for the Whiskash. And this is so risky here, throwing the Aerial Ace, and the Aerial Ace isn't enough to knock out, and it goes in between two shields, pivot into the Whiskash, and now you do have the energy advantage, and luckily, I think Caleb is out of range of Scald, so even if he does get a Scald landed on him, the Whiskash is gonna have trouble finishing off the Gligar at this range. And the other thing that you mentioned is that Polyrath in the back for Caleb has a lot of play. So remember, Kobe did save that Cresselia, it has a Grass Knot, but it is extremely low, and if that Polyrath just ends up needing to take out that Registeel at the end of the game, that could be critical. And here comes the last Protect Shield of the game for Caleb Peng, and no debuff on that Scald. And are you gonna throw on Charge Attack Priority? No, going for the Aerial Ace again, and again, it is no Protect Shielded from Kobe here. I don't know if double Aerial Ace is enough. You probably need the Dig Swap, trying to catch on the Scald, but did not catch on that Scald. And this Whiskash already has so much energy, gonna be able to get off a double Mud, mud Bomb here. I actually thought Kobe was gonna have to take out this Polyrath with a Zap Cannon, but it looks like these Mud Bombs are going to be doing a lot of damage. Already, remember, has that Grass not loaded on the Cresselia as well in the back. And now the Mud Bomb is gonna be coming through into the Polyrath. Polyrath is poised to get a counter down, so Kobe wants to deny it and combo move into the Grass Knot. There is no protections remaining for Caleb Payne, and Shadow Polyrath was his best possibility of winning this game in the back, and it just got knocked out. There's three Pokemon remaining for Kobe, but you do have that Gligar, and that Gligar is gonna match up versus the Registeel, but you can't knock out this Cresselia without taking a Grass Knot. And this Grass Knot chip is really important because otherwise this Gligar would have been out of range of a single charge attack from that Registeel, which is going to probably have to come in now. But remember, Registeel definitely survives a dig here. So Caleb gonna have to be landing a lot of moves. Here comes the Whizcash, has to throw one of the uh, charge attacks right here. And the problem is you knock out the Whizcash, but you need three digs because there's one Protect Shield remaining. And this is the third Aerial Ace that Kobe has no Protect Shield from that Shadow Gligar. You're gonna be able to Protect Shield this dig. And at this point, the Shadow Gligar is definitely in range of Focus Blast or Zap Cannon. They do the exact amount of the same amount of damage. Here comes the Protect Shield from Kobe, but Kobe is just moments away of unleashing the Focus Blast. And here oh, comes the Zap Cannon. Tries to catch the Focus Blast, but actually Kobe, too patient, throws that Zap Cannon here. And this is definitely going to be enough to take out the Azumarill. The only thing is he's actually going for an undercharge. Maybe he wants to get some lock-ons down. Oh, this is wow. actually perfect. That was fantastic on that undercharge. Undercharging is so hard to do, and Kobe in his second chance Championship Series tournament ever with the perfect undercharge absorbs the play rough remains out of range of dig and gets the lock on down beautiful play there from Kobe exits that matchup with almost 100 energy I think that is actually 100 energy Caleb does have the dig here but like you said I don't think it's going to be quite enough to take out the Registeel you just have to be mashing that focus blast or that zap cannon oh. and there it is Kobe is up 2-0 here in the zap cannon that will be resisted it doesn't matter it's going to land into the shadow Gligar and take out Caleb Peng, and that is a 2-0 lead. And how about that undercharge? Literally perfect, because if you undercharge it even more, then another Ice Beam or Play Rough comes through. And if you take that Ice Beam or Play Rough damage, then the dig knocks out. And if you didn't undercharge, you wouldn't have the energy necessarily to perfectly have the Focus Blast or Zap Cannon ready. That was amazing from Kobe. Beautiful play from Kobe, not just with that undercharge at the end, but also throughout the game. Remember. We saw Caleb trying to make some catches earlier, but Kobe, too patient, able to get the mud bombs off on that polyrath before it could do too much damage. And he has taken out Rubik's Master, Beach, Bopper. Can he now take out Caleb Peng and his Bastion oh on? No, Bastion on is coming out for game number three to join the party and swap into Cresselia. This isn't a Basti answer. No respect for the Basti. And this is exactly what Caleb wanted to see on the ropes here, about to be sent home, but all of a sudden finds what he needs with this Bastion on lead. And B Bastion, you know, this matchup isn't terrible for Cresselia. So if Caleb does decide to stay in this matchup, yes, he will gain alignment, but this Bastion won't be that healthy in the end because Cresselia, the Grass Knots add up over time, and maybe you could go for some kind of lock on down with that Registeel, but the problem is there is no place for that Registeel to really go, especially if there's Protect Shields up for Caleb Shadow Polyrath. 
fantastic read from Caleb here. That's exactly right. Butters, not just with the fast speed on lead, but there's nowhere for that Registeel to go. This is going to be have to have to be the biggest game of this Manda Buzz's life. I know Kobe said it's been carrying him, but it's probably going to have to do a lot of work against that Gligar and that Polyrath. Yeah, can the MVP Manda Buzz make a miracle happen? But here comes the Stone Edge out of the Bastion on here. There looks like Kobe is thinking about the shield, but oh, actually does shield. I'm kind of shocked at that protect shield there. Maybe he's just trying to play the one protect shield situation into this Bastion on, but I think Bastion on wins the ones also. I think it's possible he's thinking that this Cresselia might be able to outpace and get to that second grass dot before the stunch, but like you said, I think Bastion might be able to endure this next grass dot and also Switch no. advantage might not be that important. No protect shield, and it's, I mean, Bastion is so thick. Can it endure? Yeah. Yes, it does. And do you get to the Stone Edge? One oh. more Smackdown swapped into the Stone Edge, but you don't really want to take a Stone Edge in the Mandibuzz, so it was bad. It just got worse, and Caleb Pang, when his back was against the wall, he brought out that Bastion on, and now he's poised to win with Shadow Polyrath of protect shields in the back. If He could even counter through this if he wanted to, or land an Icy win, and then you have the Registeel matchup in the back. And these Snarls are resisted, so this Polyrath is feeling very comfortable here. Still has a shield farming up extra energy before throwing off this Icy one. This does threaten the knockout on the Mandibuzz, so we'll see. have to see what Kobe does. But like you said, I think he's just going to have to put it on that Registeel, and it's not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough, because even if it could beat the Shadow Polyrath somehow, there is a full health Shadow Gligar in the back, and looks like he's just giving him some momentum, but decides to throw the Icy win. Maybe he could have got the counter down, but I actually decided to use the Protect Shield. Is the Grass not available? You have to think it's available to use that Protect Shield, and it's not available, but after one cycle cut, he does get there. He does get there, but it wouldn't be enough. Caleb throwing up the Protect Shield here. I mean, this does technically give a window to Kobe because the way to take out this Polyrath is with a Zap Cannon, and for that, you need Shields down. But look at these counters. They are just adding up so quickly, and again, there is still that full health Shadow uh, Gligar in the back. Yeah, and here comes the Focus Blast. I actually, that was kind of smart, a little bit of a cheeky move from Kobe there to throw the Focus Focus Blast because Caleb was going to throw on charge attack priority of the Zap Cannon, and you actually get the knockout into the Polyrath. So I actually really like that move, but it doesn't matter in the end because that Shadow Gligar was just in the back for Caleb, and Caleb's just going to be able to clean up with the dig, and he is one step closer to trying to reverse sweep this series and move on to face Abanov in the Grand Finals in Portland. And Caleb pulling it out here with his signature Pokemon, that Bastiodon just putting in so much work. He looks very happy about that. You know, Yesterday, you watched him early on, round one or round two, and he was like, you know what, I'm happy that my Bastion done got a win on stream, but how many times has he done it today, Butters? Yeah, he says those things, but he doesn't mean it. He, he <laughs> says those things nonchalantly, like, oh, I'm just happy, maybe I'll go 0-2 now, but he is a highly competitive person, and in these situations in the past, when he has been down against it and not knowing where to go, he hasn't always brought the Bastion, and it hasn't brought him success. Maybe, yes, he's brought it against a Elite in Fresno, but then Elite had Shadow Low and Sand Slash. Now he's finally finding targets for that Bastion, and the targets were the Cresselia and the Mandibuzz. He got a Protect Shield from the Cresselia, and he landed a Stone Edge on the Mandibuzz as well. He needs to win two more games in a row, and we are locked in to game number four of the Losers Finals. It's a zoom roll into Wizcast, water on water, and I don't know if you get a Scald here in debuff, could you win this matchup? This is a great matchup for Zoomworld in general, uh, in general, because Wizcash has to throw these Mud Bombs, which is not quite as efficient of a move as Scald. Looks like he's just going for the Mud Bomb. Doesn't want to throw the Scald, because even if he gets the debuff, that Zoomworld isn't actually locked in and could just clear it. Yeah, and looks like he's not even going for the upside play of the Scald debuff. This is the most consistent play, but like you mentioned, in this matchup, a Zoomworld will win in an early particular Tech Shield on Play Rough to try to get some alignment. And if you look at the back line, the alignment's gonna matter a lot because there's Charger Bug in the back for Caleb. If that lands on the Shadow Polyrath instead of the Gligar, Caleb's gonna be in a really good spot. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest, I'm not a huge fan of that Protect Shield. I think if you're Kobe, you should just be thinking that the Gligar is incredibly safe once the Azumarill is at least chipped or, you know, almost out of the way here. Getting off this Mud Bomb here puts the Azumarill not quite into the red yet, but it looks like that next Mud Bomb is gonna come close to threatening. 
that's a great point because Azumarill really is the best counter to these ground types. And otherwise, the other counters are neutral, like a Lickitung or a Shadow Polyrath, where you get an energy advantage on your own Gligar. You can do some things in the back, so you do possibly get this alignment, but at what cost here? And the Azumarill is not going to be able to get to that Ice Beam. You do get this much shot down. And, oh my goodness. It does get to the Ice Beam with no health remaining. Caleb wins shields and alignment. Oh my goodness, Kobe all of a sudden so behind now. Like you said, doesn't have switch advantage, doesn't have a shield, does get that one counter, but here comes the Gligar, and he just didn't get enough counters to outpace to this icy one. I think Caleb's gonna get this aerial ace first. And oh, swapping. and actually tries to catch. And tries to swap onto his own Gligar here, and now the Gligar is gonna be aerial acing, and, but that means the backline matchup is gonna be Charger Bug versus Shadow Polyrath, and that's not looking very good for Kobe. Yeah, that Polyrath really had nowhere to go. I think I think you're right that Caleb bringing that Bastion on last game was really just to send a message to Kobe saying, hey, you can't disrespect Bastion, you have to bring those counters. And if you look at what Kobe brought this game, he brought three Bastion counters. He brought the Whizcash, the Polyrath, and the Gligar. I think Caleb saw that coming, saw that adjustment coming, and ends up bringing this backline of Gligar Charge Bug, which just counters the Polyrath so perfectly. And that's why these best of five series are so high level, because you can make those strategy moves with your team compositions to change the entire outcome of the series and suddenly Caleb is now closing in on a game number four win with this knockout with the arrow ace you imagine it's going to be an instant pivot into the charge bug no actually wants to soak energy oh this is tough though can oh, he get, get the, the counter away? down, he, get the counter he, down? The no, he doesn't get the counter down so has to commit the icy win but there's a protect shield remaining in the either way and that could have been close if this Polyrath would have been able to get off two charge attacks. But like you said, still a protect shield remaining. This charge bug is incredibly healthy, actually, and just able to Volt Switch down. And we're going to head into a decisive game five here. Caleb, all of a sudden, on the brink, comes back from an 0-2 deficit. It's 2-2 two to two in the Losers Finals at the Portland Regional, the first regional of 2024. And remember, Caleb Pang has been a runner-up two times. He was down two to zero. He is just now one win away from making it back to the grand finals and having a chance of being getting his first ever regional championship. And this is gonna be the decisive game number five. Whichever trainer wins this battle is moving on to the grand finals to face Abinov. It's a zoom rule into Registeel. What a call from Kobe. This is a fantastic lead. It resists all of Azumarill's charge attacks, and Caleb forced to swap out right away into a hard counter of that Gligar, but Kobe doesn't have a great answer. He's gonna stay in, maybe take a charge move, maybe try to throw a Zap Cannon. Oh no, and the dig is gonna be coming out, so now you're gonna have to either give up a Protect Shield, you give up a Protect Shield on this safe swap, and are you gonna go for the Zap Cannon? You need to get some sort of advantage for your Whizcash or your Carcelli in the back. Also, if you come in on your Whizcash, these lock-ons didn't do enough damage, you need to put this in Scald range. The Zap Cannon does put this Gligar in skull range, but you decided to swap to Cresselia instead because it's getting close to Grass Knot range. It is in Grass Knot range. That's going to be a great, efficient use of energy here, but Cresselia needs to come out of this with a lot of energy because if Caleb comes back in with the Azumarill, you want to be able to get off as many Grass Knots as you can. And here comes the Cresselia with the energy, but over farming, getting nearly to 100 energy there before throwing the Grass Knot into this Shadow Gligar. And Caleb actually protects you. It's the Grass Knot. One Psycho cut away from the next one throw on charge attack priority. No, Caleb doesn't throw. He double shields his Gligar. And Caleb's investing a lot into this Gligar. I have to, I was wondering if he lost count, but it looks like that's exactly what he wanted. He leaves that matchup, saves all the energy and comes into this charge bug. I like this play from Caleb a lot. He recognizes that those switch clocks are so misaligned. Kobe can't actually switch yet into his Whizcash. Incredibly misaligned here, but you're just letting the Cresselia go. So now the Cresselia goes down. Does it go down? No, it oh, hangs on side. with one health. That is a huge break from Kobe. They are able to endure the x and repay it with a future sight before you go down. Kobe brings in that Whizcaster straight away here. Caleb trying to fire off this x 
and maybe trying to stall at the switch clock just a little bit, but Kobe is just going to need to be over farming here. And remember, we, had, we started this game with Registeel versus Azumarill. Those Pokemon are still alive, but Caleb also saved that Shadow Gligar with some energy. But that is destined to be the backline matchup, and this Whiskash is just farming up a bunch of energy. Could have thrown a Mud Bomb or a Skull. Maybe you needed the Skull to knock out, but instead took the Excessor, and now you're almost at your switch timer, maybe about five seconds away, so you can't swap out quite yet. Throwing the Mud Bomb to knock out Caleb Peng's Charger Bug, but you can't come in with the Gligar because that doesn't want to soak any energy. So you come in with the Azumarill. Can you do enough damage with Gligar to weaken the Registeel? Well, Caleb's going to come in with the Azumarill. I think he threw a Mud Bomb and that puts it into... Oh my goodness, oh. actually throws a Scald. Maybe expecting the Gligar to come in, but either way, I think the Scald almost puts the Azumarill into Lock on plus Zap Cannon Range. Risky play here, swapping in the Registeel, counter swapping into the Gligar. We can Gligar double dig? If Gligar can double dig here, that could be a wrap. I mean, the protect shield is going to be coming up at some point. There is no protect shield on the first one. Maybe he's thinking it would be a bait. It's not a bait. It's the dig and actually throwing Aerial Ace at oh Aerial Ace energy. And Kobe protect shields it anyway. Pulls the shield. This Registeel is going to be able to get to a charge attack, but it's getting dangerously low after that dig landed. Here comes the focus blast, but I think the Azumarill is still out of Zap Cannon Rage. And I think it's going to be able to get through this Registeel with bubbles and a resisted charge attack. That's the biggest question, So, Is this Registeel in range of play rough. Caleb Payne needs to knock out with a resisted play rough to have a chance of going on to the grand finals. It all comes down to this. Will Azumarill do it? And does he knock out the Registeel? Yes! He knocks out the Registeel. Now he's just moments away from getting to the Ice Beam. He is there with one more bubble. And Caleb Payne is moving on to the grand finals to face Abhinav. What a run by Caleb, coming back from that 0-2 deficit, getting the reverse sweep there, coming out of a terrible lead, by the way, with Azumarill into Registeel, but just got that momentum back in the mid game with that safe swap. That was amazing with the safe swap Gligar. Not only did he get a protect shield from the Registeel, then he double shielded Grass Knots. <laughs> I know Caleb pretty well. I've watched him compete a lot. I've talked to him a lot about Pokemon Go. That was some high level play that I didn't see where he was going with it to hang on to that Gligar. He knew that his destiny was going to be an Azumarill Registeel backline matchup, and he needed that Gligar around to have a chance in this game. He double invested in it and it worked off. He pulled off the reverse sweep to move it on to the grand finals. That was some incredible play by Caleb. Like you said, investing in that Gligar. I think he knew that that Gligar was gonna be key to taking out that Registeel, and indeed it was. We saw it land a dig later, which really paved the way for the Azumarill to close out that game. And Thank you so much so for the introduction. She's right. I am joined by both Caleb and Abhinav for the grand finals. How are you both feeling, starting with Abhinav? I feel elated. Uh, I've exceeded all my expectations. My goal, honestly, was top three, which is like already such a crazy goal to begin with. And being in grand finals, not having dropped the set yet, it feels really amazing. I feel blessed. Caleb? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm surprised I'm here. I, I would have loved another shot at a championship title, but there's a lot of really competitive people here. And I, I didn't think I would have made it this far, especially after losing the Rubik's on day number one. But I'm very excited to be here, and honestly, I'm pretty excited even if I take second here. And what we've been doing here back behind the caster booth in, in the caster uh, lounge as well is we try to build stories. And Abhinav, you've talked a lot about what it means to be representation for India here in the Pokemon Go Championship Series. How does it feel and what does it mean to you to be here in the Grand Finals? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, it obviously means a lot. Um, it, it feels like kind of like a burden of responsibility but also a great honor to like have so uh, people from like such a massive country supporting me all the dms i get from people like you got this india's rooting for you um all the people from india who helped me practice like yeah I, I wouldn't be where i am today if it wasn't for like the indian community um a lot of friends i've made there i spent like i grew up in india first of all but even like i was there recently the pvp community there is like growing and not just that, even like Chicago, like the, the friends I've made in Chicago for like five years, uh, the entire journey I've been on doing solo Sylph uh, and then switching to play Pokemon. This feels like a culmination of it all. So yeah, it feels amazing. Thank you for that response. And Caleb, 
You're from the United States, so not quite the same question to you, but you are two for two in making it from Top Cut into second place. What does it mean to you to have a shot to go for number one here? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, it doesn't, it's not as significant. I think it's a great honor just to even be sitting here for in that number two spot. And uh, I've been playing pretty good this weekend, so I wouldn't <laughs> be surprised if I just get swept in this first uh, uh -huh. bracket, but, um, but I'm gonna give it my all too. Thanks. Uh, so, Pokemon now. Wish Cash has been a mm -hmm. live and die for you. Are you feeling confident with your chance to get Skull debuffs here in the Grand Finals? <laughs> now, honestly, I'm just gonna throw a Mud Bomb and just not avoid the Skull <laughs> entirely. No, uh, jokes aside, um, yeah, like, you live by the Skull, die by the Skull, but the, just the damage output of Skull itself is, like, so prominent that, yes, the debuff would be amazing, and there have been a couple games where I wished I got the debuff and didn't, a couple games I was super lucky to get the debuff, but... Debuffs and buffs aside, like I think Whiskash is a great uh, mon in the meta right now. It's so flexible, so safe into most teams, so threatening with an energy lead, and yeah, I've been loving it. And to you, Caleb, the double weakness again, Bastidon, live and die by it. How do you feel about Bastidon here? And I know you've been kind of using it, not using it in different battles. How, how are you feeling about Bastion here? Yeah, I mean, I feel great. I mean, there were so many games where, uh, like game three, just uh, when I was down 0-2, I was just like, you know what? Bastion on our bus, and uh, it worked out, and I was able to kind of reverse sweep. So it's been really good, and honestly, there's a lot of Cresselia, a lot of Lickitung, and just way better than carping in those matchups. Definitely. Uh, as we're wrapping up this interview, any people that you'd like to shout out now that you he are here on your way to the Grand Finals, scrim partners, people who you've helped uh, team build with, anyone else that you know is going to be watching back at home? That's a super difficult question because I feel if I try to name people one by one, I would obviously leave out some people because so many people have helped me on this journey and I, I would not want to hurt people like that. So I'll just say all the friends who've helped me in Pokemon Go battles, all the people who sent me even a small wish of good luck, friends, family outside Pokemon Go who kept my spirits up. I just graduated college, so... Um, Congratulations. It, thank you, thank you. It's, uh, I, it, I wouldn't be here where I am without every little person I've talked to over like the last few years of my life, so... Yeah, people, the, the people in my life who know they are, they know that I'm super grateful. And to you, Caleb? Um, yeah, I shout out some people earlier, but again, shout out to Hard Jeff, uh, who did some scrims and uh, practice with me, as well as Anacor, IV Pips last second, uh, a lot of my teammates, uh, Ramberto and Kimmy Sui and the Cool Cats. Um, and just shout out to my family, friends, and loved ones who've been supporting me throughout. All right, well, thank you both so much for this wonderful interview. Good luck in the grand finals and get out of here, get back to the <laughs> stage. We got some action for you. Thanks. Take it away, casters. So he has to be feeling pretty good, but let's take one last look at Abinov's accomplishments and his team. This is actually his first top cut ever. And I want to point out, he competed a lot in 2022, and he had multiple ninth place appearances, so losing in the losers' finals. And then I believe he was ninth place in the India qualifiers as well, so he was so close to getting top cut, and this time he is top cut, which I'm just going to say it now, this might be the team that everyone copies. He copied the iteration from Wadage. He made it better. His words, not mine. I think it is better, though. And so I feel like other trainers might be using this team as a template for future tournaments. That's right. It's like the next evolution of that meta team. And it could be exactly right what trainers kind of look to as their model. We saw some trainers looking at Dunebug's team from the last tournament. And here we have Kayla Pang on the other side, standing in Abunov's way. We did just see those accomplishments. Again, he's been second place twice before. And I want to also call out Caleb's consistency. He's only played in three tournaments before this, and he was second place in two of them. This is actually right. only his fourth tournament ever. He's again in his third Grand Finals. 75% chance at the Grand Finals. <laughs> That's a better chance than Zap Cannon. So well done to Caleb Peng there. And of course, he is bringing that signature Pokemon Bastion. I'm really interested to see how much it is deployed here, because if you look at the counters from Abinov, he has Vigoroth. He has Whizcash. He has Gligar. Azumarill, there is play for Bastion because there is no Hydro Pump available. And even, I think you mentioned, there is some play against Gligar as well, but you just don't want to finish out that matchup because eventually Gligar usually gets that third dig. 
That's absolutely right. And looking at these teams of six, I think they both have some flexible options here. It's not just going to be Bastion Down or Bust. Oh, looks there like it is! This. There it is! The start off the grand finals! It's the Bastion on into the Charger Bug, instant pivot into Whizcatch, bent by the Shadow Polyrath. It looks like Abinov did get a little bit of an energy advantage, but how much is that going to matter? Like he said, he's just going for Mud Bombs now. He doesn't need the Skull Bait. Wait, wait a second. Actually, protectioning this because I know one thing. Bastionon doesn't need a single protect shield against Charger Bug, so you might as well use them with the Shadow Polyrath. And I think Caleb is thinking perhaps that first Mud Bomb will do a little bit more damage if he hits the Skull debuff here. The good news for Abunov, though, is unlike Caleb's past opponents, he's actually not ABA weak to the Bastion. He's just A weak. Yeah, he was weak to it in the lead, but that was enough to gain some sort of advantage here because you got the, the attack drop here, you use the protect shield, but you're able to get a couple counters of energy. You're going to at least be able to throw a Scald into that Charger Bug. Here comes the Charger Bug. You're going to be want to be patient, get to that Scald. Here is the Scald from Caleb here, but you're going to be able to soak all that energy with Bastion on. And this is looking like an uphill battle for Abunov. This energy from Charger Bug isn't going to be doing a whole lot. Looks like he's trying to get an energy advantage here, but met by the Azumarill from Caleb. Even though this Azumarill is down, if you look at those bubbles, they are already chunking away super effective damage. Remember, this is the Timeless Travels update, and in this update, Bubble got a damage increase. So Azumarill was already strong, and now it does a little bit more damage with that bubble. It is down a Protect Shield, but I'm not sure how much that is going to matter because you're going to be able to land this Ice Beam. Yes, it gets Protect Shielded up, but you're just whittling down this Gligar, and eventually that Bastion is going to be able to clean up everything. I think that's exactly right. Look at how low this Gligar is, and Azumarill still has a shield. Getting the last Protect Shield from Abinav here probably with this Ice Beam, but even if Abinov is able to get through this Azumarill, I think that Bastionon is just going to be able to smack down down. Yeah, and I don't, uh, one dig is not going to even knock out a Bastionon here, so it's going to be able to soak that up if it comes down to it. Looks like Caleb's going to just save that Protect Shield for the Bastionon. You had two options there. You could have tried to get some more bubbles off, and they actually do endure, so you do get one more bubble off. That's nice for Caleb. I'm sure he's going to bring in the Bastion. Here comes the Bastion. I don't think you get the double dig, so that's why you're trying to bait with the Aerial Ice, so you can maybe get to a dig, but I don't know if you get to a dig. Yeah, I think he's going to get to a dig now, though, thanks to that bait. Barely able to get there. Maybe on TNP. Do go for catch. Oh, oh he tries to catch, and it's a simultaneous swap. Abinov saw it coming. He swapped at the same time. Kayla swapped, and suddenly it's not over. You need to land a discharge, though. Can you get double discharge? It looks like the damage registered. I think you get double discharge here. Wait, you get the discharges, but doesn't the Glagar also have a dig loaded? Does this yeah. discharge put the Bastion into no, single dig No, you get double dig discharge. You get double discharge, and now the double discharge, it has to be a dig range now, right? This is a shadow Glygar. It's double super effect. I think Bastion is going to be going down its calf. Charge attack priority. I don't think Bastion can endure. And Bastion is an incredibly tanky Pokemon, but actually does faint to that dig. And Abinov wow. out of nowhere taking that first game. Incredible patience from Abinov, knowing that Caleb needed to swap to avoid that dig. Swaps at the exact same time, gets that Volt Switch on the swap, and he actually needed that Volt Switch, I think, to land the double discharge. I'm not sure if one discharge would have put Bastion in range of dig. And we've seen this matchup before. The Azumarill into the Whizcash is a great matchup for the Azumarill. And I don't know if Abinov is going to try to go for an upside small play. He said in his interview he's not going to try to go for those plays, but I feel like he might be going for it, though. He is going to decide to just bank up energy and then last second, almost at 100, throw the, the Mud Bomb. So this is a very bad matchup for the Whizcash. We actually saw last series, remember, Whizcash can even spend a Protect Shield here and still lose Switch Advantage. So I'm guessing that Abinov maybe saw that, maybe going to be happy to just soft lose this because just like we were saying, Azumarill is the only counter to Shadow Gligar, right? So once this Azumarill is out of the way or softened up by the Whizcash, I think Abinov is going to be putting a lot of weight onto that Gligar in the back. I agree with that because if you do soft lose that, you can just come in with Lickitung. You just lick down, you save the Protect Shields for the Shadow Gligar, and you still have a lot of options. So even though this looks rough for Abinov here, it's not too bad. I don't think you're going to commit anything to this Whizcash. And weirdly, it feels like his Whizcash is doing better than Kobe's Whiz Clash was doing in that opener of last series. They love just throwing off this ice beam here. I don't think this is quite enough to KO, but maybe just looking to get... Oh, actually it is. Yeah, that was a nice ice beam there. 
Azumarill for Caleb Payne has been getting a lot of knockouts in these matchups, and now you're going to actually get to a play rough, too. It doesn't look like Caleb wants to pivot. You know, usually Caleb pivots there. Caleb has been fl so fluid in his gameplay, especially when he doesn't have Bastille on his team. He's been pivoting, and instead, he just lets the Lickitung use energy swap, swap, but now you're down energy against Gligar. Yeah, I think, you know, Caleb normally would pivot there, but perhaps recognizing how good that Gligar is, and he risked bringing that charge bug in the back, which we know is so uh, terrible in its matchup against Gligar, so potentially didn't want to give that up. Caleb is in a tough position for two reasons. One, he's down energy in this mirror matchup. Two, Lickitung beats Charger Bug neutrally. I don't know how he comes out of this. He is down in two matchups, the matchup in front of him and the matchup in the back, and he just used his first protect shield of the game on Aerial Ace. And it's looking good for Abinov. Like you said, I think Abinov has the advantage in, not only in this particular matchup, but also in that back line matchup. But like we said, only even though the lead was bad, it's not a one versus one game. It's three versus three. And I think Abinov's backline really counters Caleb's here. And here comes the aerial ace. Abinov is thinking, does he go for his last protect shield of the game? He does go for it. Now the timer is almost up. No, it's not quite up yet, but maybe about 10 more seconds. You can throw the aerial ace there, but wow, wait a second. Now suddenly Caleb is going to have an extra protect shield with the charger bug. This is almost going to knock out. Do you swap? Try to get a volt switch through. Wait a second. It did knock out. Now you're up a shield with the charger bug. What is happening? Yeah. I'm curious why Abinov didn't try to throw that last aerial ace on the opposing Gligar. I believe he was up energy, so he should have been there. He I was. He was, I think, two or three wing attacks over aerial ace, if I counted correctly, and he didn't throw it. Maybe he was expecting the timers were up, but his timer was exactly synced with Caleb. So he knew where the timer was exactly. So that was a bit of a misstep, and that misstep is going to cost them a crucial game number two. Yeah, I think maybe just lost the count a little bit there, or maybe, like you said, maybe try to anticipate a swap, or maybe thinking that the aerial ace didn't even knock out there, but regardless of the reason, I think that did cost him, and Caleb is going to be able to tie up the series now. And it is one to one in this grand finals. In game number one, Abinov made that amazing play. Game number two, he gave life to Caleb, and so it kind of evens out here at a one-to-one -one score and it's anyone's series now he had a good chance of having a commanding 2-0 lead versus Caleb and how hard would that be being down 0-2 and you have to reset the bracket and then win it all but Abinov let one of these games go we're back in game number three of your Portland Grand Finals and here we are again. It's the Azumarill into the Wizcash in the lead. It's the exact same backline, but look at this. Caleb changed his backline, so instead of running Charger Bug to face the Lickitung, which loses neutrally, now he has Bastiodon to beat the Lickitung neutrally. And Abinov is seeing this lead, probably thinking that he can play it out the same way he did before, but maybe just play a little bit better in that endgame. But he's going to have this very unpleasant surprise of the Bastiodon, because if he loses switch advantage, the Gligars will be on in the mirror match, and the Lickitung is going to be on the Bastiodon, which is a very bad matchup for the Lickitung. And he probably feels confident that he can just play it out exactly like he played it out in game number two and just and just play better. And just throw that aerial ace, pick up the protect shield, and just do things differently. But it's not the same game as game number two. Now Bastiodon's in the back, so if it plays out equally, I think Caleb is pretty far ahead here because it's destined to be Bastiodon versus that Lickitung. I think that's exactly right. That's what we might see end up happening. Remember last game, this Ice Beam took out the Wizcash, and Abinov is probably just going to bring in the Lickitung here, maybe try to throw a Body Slam. I don't think we're going to see... Oh, Caleb actually pivots out, though. Wow, I, I was saying this last game that usually Caleb pivots, and this time was the one time you have Bastion on. I don't know if you pivot with Bastion on, but that is why Caleb is a unique Bastion on player because it's not all about alignment for him. He just wants to play the game fluidly and he thinks Bastion is a very strong neutral pick and he got the swap he wanted anyway. The patience trying to catch a dig but catches an aerial ace instead. And Caleb, I think, wanted to save that Azumarill for this Gligar. He might have been anticipating, but now the problem is I don't think Abinov knows there's a Bastion on. He doesn't know just how valuable this Gligar is that Lickitung isn't going to be able to finish it off and unfortunately this Gligar is locked in here it's getting very very deep into the red almost getting wing attacks down here and even if he didn't think Bastion is in the back it would actually if Abinov thought it was charge bug in the back I'm surprised he did bring in that Gligar because Gligar would have been so strong against that charge bug in the back as Caleb does secure the knockout this Lickitung is
Ice is going to be able to lick down, but it no actually doesn't even lick down because the Aerial Ice is coming out and Lickitung is going to be too low or use a Protect Shield and you got a full Bastion on in incoming. And Butters, we've said it before, Abinov kind of chuckling when he sees this Bastion, but Lickitung <laughs> is not a closer, right? It doesn't have the charge attack pressure that you need. Even though there are two shields up here, I don't think there's a single Pokemon in the back line that it could have been where this Lickitung would have been in a winning position. Yeah, trying to go for the bait here on that Body Slam. It doesn't pay off. Caleb knew it. As soon as he brought Bastion on up, he kind of looked at Abinov, looked at the crowd, knew it was a GG because his favorite Pokemon is going to give him a two to one advantage in these grand finals with just a couple more Smackdowns. Didn't even need to use that Azumarill that he saved. And I think Abinov, you know, maybe a little bit detached from the end of that game here, doesn't want to see the Bastiodon taking out his Lickitung and potentially just starting to plan out for this game four. We do see, oh my goodness, Lickitung into a Bastiodon, just how the last game ended. And two Bastiodon counters in the back, so swapping in the Whizcash meant by the Polyrath. Now we need to key in on, will Caleb make the same decision? Is he going to shield this Mud Bomb? We saw in game number, he does it again. He doubles down. He thinks this strategy is going to work out in the end using the Protect Shield. But I think that turned out pretty well for Abinov in game one because it ended up being that Abinov needed to land a critical charge attack in the end game, and Caleb didn't have a shield because he used it on this Mud Bomb here. Abinov actually choosing to shield up this skull there. Is he thinking that he can maybe switch uh, this matchup? And he got the attack drop, so I don't think he can switch the matchup now. Going to throw the Mud Bomb. Maybe you could have won the zeros with double Mud Bomb before the attack drop. That's why Caleb decided to to use the protect shield here, but there's just no way now. You just don't have the reach. This this mud bomb doesn't do as much damage. You can let this go if you're Caleb. You can throw the icy wind and then probably get a protect shield. You have all the momentum in this matchup. Well, this does seem like it was part of Abinov's plan to maybe actually, I was going to say beta at the Polyrath, but looking at Abinov's team, he's actually pretty much triple weak to this Polyrath. The good news is, though, he's going to have to rely a lot on this Vigoroth. It's going to have a lot of play against that Bastion. It does technically have play against that Shadow. Oh my goodness, getting an energy advantage, but taking a lot of super effective counter damage. Yeah, that was a lot. Now it's about 65% health, and yes, it can beat Shadow Gligar in the one protect shield situation, but that's when Vigoroth is at full health. I mean, it's going to be able to land this Body Slam into the Gligar. I think that was charge attack priority. I believe the Aerial Ace did register. I think it did. Here comes that Aerialist. I think Abinov needs to shield this up. Otherwise, he has no way to get through the Bastion. What Abinov needs to happen is he needs to take out this Gligar. He needs to get enough counter damage off on the Bastion for that Lickitung to be able to clean it up. That's exactly right. You need to keep this Vigor off the round because it just five counters, six counters, it might be enough to flip that matchup between Lickitung and Bastion, and that's what you need to do in this situation. Swap into the Lickitung and then swap into the Bastion, but there's two things to look at here. Bastion will win this matchup, but my biggest question is how much time on the switch timers will be available once Bastion wins this matchup, and I know that must be going through Caleb's head also. Abinov did switch just a split second before Caleb did, so I think there's just a couple seconds of delay. Caleb reacted pretty quickly though, and, but the thing is, how much margin does Bastion win this matchup by, right? Because I, I don't think the switch clock, or sorry, I think the switch clock is going to come up before this matchup ends. Abinov's going to come in, try to get some counters off, and then try to come out with a body slam for the Gligar. And if you are Caleb, how much do you delay your victory? We've seen this in a matchup before between Onion Frank had a Skarmory against a Gligar. Even though Skarmory beats Gligar, he wanted to lose the matchup because he didn't want to give momentum to the other opponent. The switch timer is actually pretty much up. It looks like Abinov is just reaching for it and then throws the Power Whip. It looks like it will be available as soon as this Power Whip comes off. If you can sneak in a counter or two, here comes the Vigoroth. It's unleashed with the counters, but Caleb, Caleb sees it coming. He saw it instantly and he, the quick reflex is to throw the Stone Edge and knock out the Vigoroth. And that really was Abinov's only play to try to take advantage of that desynchronized switch timer to get some energy, maybe come out with energy for this Gligar. But unfortunately, Caleb saw it coming. He already had the energy banked on that Gligar as well. And all of a sudden, Caleb up 3-1. to one. I think that's a Grand Finals reset. That is a Grand Finals reset. He won this series 3-1 to one on the loser side. So now Abinov and Caleb both have one loss in the tournament. That means they replay the Grand Finals. And whoever wins the Grand Finals will be your 20. 24 Portland Regional Champion. So much momentum for Caleb here. Just before this, remember in those losers finals, we saw him climb out of an 0-2 hole to take that 3-2 victory. Here he was down 0-1 and he's already up 
3-1, gotten that reset, and now he's into the grand finals. He was on the winner's side. He lost 1-3, but he still has a chance, and he has the Azumarill leading against Bastion, and he's actually shaking his head a little bit. Yeah, these bubbles are super effective, but all those charge packs are reset. actually goes straight away into the Whiskash. Unlike before, it's actually not by the, met by the Polyrath. It's met by the Azumarill. And I'm actually surprised by that swap. Yes, you do, you can lose the Bastion on because you have Ice Beam play rough, but Bubble does more damage now. And even if you lose, it would be a very soft loss. And how much do you actually need the alignment in the back? You would probably just get, wow, Protect Shielding on an Ice Beam? Oh yeah, I don't know about this. We've seen this before. Wizcash can lose this matchup even using one Protect Shield. See, I thought Abinov's plan was going to be to put it all on that Vigoroth. I think the reason he swapped is because, yes, the Zoomerl has a decent but not great matchup into the Bastion, but Vigoroth and Wizcash have a very dominant matchup, right? I thought he was just going to try to put it all on the Vigoroth, but it looks like he's already choosing to invest in this Wizcash, maybe trying to flip switch advantage. He definitely did invest, and it was actually interesting that Caleb went for that Ice Beam there, and now he's going to be able to throw another Ice Beam because he knows two charge attacks is going to be his win condition against the Wizcash. So you don't need to throw the play rough. You just want to try to go for double ice beam here and your timers back up but you don't really want to swap into anything uh with bastion and gligar in your back line but this is actually a little bit different from that lead versus lead matchup look at this caleb is being forced to shield but actually i think this whiskash is very close to a mud bomb it might even be able to outpace the azumarill and get off a charge back before this ice beam no it's not the ice beam comes up first and will azumarill and caleb win this alignment here abanov is just going for it he's doubling down he's trying to take out that bastion in the back with the vigor off i think he can do it he just has to get the double mud bomb here's the first mud bomb and i feel like caleb's gonna let this go or either shield and swap because you can't win the alignment you just gotta let it go he's got to oh, swap he shields, but he has the double already he has does the he double swap? what does, does he, he do he has to swap oh God, somewhere he no go. he lets it go a rare mistake from caleb there i don't know if he knew he was at the double but abanov we thought it was a strange play, but he won swap. He won switch advantage. Now he's going to get that alignment that he wanted. Vigor off on Bastion in Azumarill. He doesn't know it yet, but it's going to be seeing a Gligar in the back. And all of a sudden, Whiskash versus Azumarill. Whiskash took that matchup. Yeah, straight mud bomb. Uh, that was crazy. And now it's Vigor off versus Bastion. And yes, they don't know it yet what the backline matchup will be, but this is pretty much a wrap. And suddenly, where Abinov felt like he had no momentum at all. He has it all back here because he's going to comfortably take out this Gligar and take this game number one of the grand finals. It's going to be a slow death, though, because we don't have any charge attack pressure on Abinov's side to take out that Bastion. Remember, this Azumarill only has Ice Beam and Play Rough. Vigoroth only has Body Slam and Rock Slide. So it's really just going to be fast news taking out that Bastion. Yeah, it's going to be Bubble and Counter finishing up the day for Abinov here, but there's just it, there's not enough health on the Bastion, and Bastion still has to get through this Azumarill. Yes, you don't have any charge attacks that really threaten, but if Bastion can win this, Bastion is just insane. As bubbles are adding up, almost at parity in terms of health with this Azumarill once the bubble lands. But remember, we've still got that bigger off in the back on the side of Abinov. I mean, I think what Caleb would need to do here is build up to two stone edges. And he threw on charge attack priority, and that's not what Caleb was looking for there. He was trying to land that stone edge before to try to land the stone edge into the Vigoroth. And now you're just going to be way too low because you can't bank double stone edge if you are Bastion. You just don't have the energy capabilities because you cap out at 100 energy. So one counter, oh, rock slide instead of the extra counter. Rock slide is going to knock out Caleb Peng. And Abinov has all those momentums back. He is up 1-0 to zero against Caleb Peng. It looks like Abinov found the recipe. Remember, we saw those games earlier. He played Wizcash into a Zumaro lead, I believe, twice and lost that game lost that matchup as well. But all of a sudden here, Wizcash on the safe swap, just up a little bit of energy, was actually able to flip the twos against the Zoomerall. Bastion on once again versus Shadow Gligar, safe swap into his own Shadow Gligar. There's not a clear answer, so it looks like Abinov is gonna stay in, and this time, I think he's gonna try to capitalize on that one wing attack advantage. That's right, he does get that fantastic lead. Caleb forced to swap, now he's locked in, and now Abinov has chipped and dipped, going into his own Lickitung. But actually now he's not going to be able to line up the Lickitung on that Azumarill in the back. Oh, and I think this is a charge attack priority. If that is a charge attack priority, that's pretty big for Abinov because Caleb is at double aerial ace. So if it is, in fact, a cap, we're going to find out if it registered. Yes. So now Caleb has a tough decision. You can see on his face, does he try to commit to the Gligar? Yeah, you didn't want to waste all that energy. 
That's right. That's a great play by Abinov, by the way. Throwing on even a losing charge attack priority, which isn't generally a good thing. But if your opponent is doubled up like that, you're actually forcing them to shield or lose that second attack that they have. And I think you actually get a shield back here because you throw the aerial ace and then you throw the dig. And that dig should either get a knockout or a protect shield. But Abinov cuts it off with the body slam. I love that play from Abinov. And you get both of the protect shields out of Caleb here. And he does get both protect shields, but remember, Caleb has two extremely bulky Pokemon in general. This is where he would want to invest the protect shields. I mean, I'm actually letting this dig go all of a sudden, giving up switch advantage. But the thing is, he has that double ground core butters. He's trapped the Bastiodon. Yeah, he's going to bring in the Azumarill. And then once he sees that Wiz Cash, there is no way, no shot a Bastion can get through a Wiz Cash, and especially when you have a two protect shield advantage. And here comes that dig on the Azumarill, expecting a swap from Abinov here. Now that the Azumarill is softened, you can just let this Whiskash finish out the game. He's actually up two shields as well. He knows these ice teams are going to do more than any charge attack from Bastion, and Abinov all of a sudden has the momentum back. He does. He is close to being up 2-0 in this matchup, in this grand finals reset. He has the Whiskash, which how about double grounds here in Portland? Whiskash Shadow Gligar has been so strong, and especially against a basket on team, it looks even stronger. And we saw Caleb before kind of dictating the pace of the matchup, bringing that Bastion on in to get into the opponent's head. But I think he's brought it just a little bit too much now. These last couple of games, all it's seen, it's going to see the Wiz Cash now. And last game also found a disadvantageous matchup against the Vigoroth after giving up switch advantage. And that Mud Bomb doesn't quite knock out, but you will get the Mud Shot down. You still have one Protect Shield remaining, and you will secure... No! Look at this Azumarill! <laughs> it still has some fight left in it! Gonna get that last Protect Shield on the Wiz Cash and go down, but you have all this energy on the Whizcatch. You can double Mud Bomb here, no problem. I believe the Gligar even has a little energy as well. And Abinov looking very unconcerned by that Ice Beam. Here comes that first Mud Bomb. Actually, doesn't even do half of what wow. Bastiodon has. Gonna throw after four more Mud Shots here on perfect timing there. And then just a couple more Mud Shots, maybe even just throw that last Mud Bomb as well. Yeah, two more Mud Shots throw the Mud Bomb, secure the 2-0 two two lead, <laughs> and then he gets it right there. There's the Mud Bomb, there's the knockout. Abinov is up 2-0 against Caleb Peng in his one game away from being your Portland Regional Champion. But so, remember, Caleb was in this exact position in the Losers Finals versus Kobe. He was in an 0-2 hole, and he was able to reverse sweep to make it into the Grand Finals. Can he repeat that magic? Here we are. Abinov is one game away from being the Portland Regional Champion, and he has Wiz Cash aligned on Bastion. But not only that, he is ABA strong to Bastion on, so now he has the Lickitung to counter this Azumarill. But so, where is Bastion gonna go in this game? It's looking good for Abinov. Again, he has that double ground core. Bastion has nowhere to go. It doesn't even matter if Abinov loses switch advantage here, which of course he might not because Lickitung has a very good matchup against the Azumarill, but Abinov has the alignment he needs. He's going to get that Gligar on the Polyrath in the back as well. I mean, calling the Body Slam bait might be big for Caleb here. If he can somehow get some Protect Shields, his only opportunity here is a Protect Shield advantage with Shadow Polyrath in the back. I don't know how he's going to get that, especially since he just used the Protect Shield. I don't know how he's going to get that advantage with Shadow Polyrath in the back. Well, he might be he might be going for alignment here. He might be thinking, look, if it's the double ground core, I have very little play anyways. Azumarill can actually technically, I believe, win the two shield situation against Lickitung. Caleb might just be going for alignment here, hoping that that Bastion has a target in the back. And here comes the power whip. There's one protect shield remaining. If Caleb tries to call a body slam, it's going to be really tough for Caleb here. Does he try to call a body slam? He tries to call the body slam, and it's almost a knockout in Azumarill, so it comes down to fast attacks, and Lickitung wins with the one-turn fast attack. The no health Lickitung holds on and suddenly Abinov has alignment and shield advantage. And Abinov able to get the Gligar on the Polyrath. He's only behind one fast attack and he has to be feeling good. Caleb going for the catch here. Abinov doesn't fall for it. Brings in that whiz catch and I think Abinov knows he is going to take this 3-0 victory. There was nowhere for Bastion to go. The only place this Bastion can go is back in its Pokemon.
Pokeball because there's two ground types in the back for Avanov. The boldness from Caleb Pang to bring the Bastion on against this double ground team. Avanov decided to run ABA ground and it worked out. Caleb said he's living or dying by the Bastion, and you have to give him credit. This Bastion got him so far. It made such a difference in a lot of his matchups throughout his run. Unfortunately, not going to be quite able to get it in this Grand Finals, but you know what? Caleb got very far with this Pokemon that he hasn't brought a lot in the past. It's been very impressive to see him put the Bastion on the field. It has won him games, but in this scenario, in this meta where you have Gligar and Wizcash being number one and number two in usage in the top cut. It might have not been the opportunity, and Abanov will be your Portland Regional Grand Champion! Congratulations to Abinov. First time appearing in the top cut, taking out so many big names, coming in on the winner side of the bracket. Fends off Caleb Kang after that grand finals reset. And it felt like Caleb had all the momentum after that grand finals reset. He was able to win three in a row after going down one game. And remember, Abinov was really close to being up two to zero in that first series. So he dropped that game number two, but and then dropped three games in a row, but I think you mentioned a little bit of a mental reset, and that really paid off. Let's take a look at the event winners right now. This is gonna be Abhinav, of course. We just saw on stage winning the championship here. And then Caleb Payne, second place, a placement he's kind of used to at this point. He said he'd be happy with it. I don't <laughs> believe him, but that's what he said. And of course, Kobe, the trainer who knocked out or took down Rubik's Master, Beach, Bopper, took Abhinav to a best of five. I believe he was up two to one against Abhinav and Abhinav came back in that series and then even was up two to zero oh against Caleb Pang. So a really impressive run by Kobe Coupling. Impressive run indeed. I'm sure we'll have a lot of Kobe in the future to look forward to. But once again, congratulations to Caleb and Abinov. You know, Caleb has to be proud of himself. Remember, he came in to this day two on the loser side of the bracket, dropped early to Rubik's Master, had to win, I think, five or six in a row to be in that grand finals, ended up resetting the grand finals, got incredibly close, but Abinov was able to persevere. Yeah, and had to. Yesterday, he lost the Rubik's Master, had to have that rematch here today. And it was really cool to see at the beginning. We had four losers finals to get those top cuts in the day number two and all four of them were rematches and <laughs> two of them were with the top two seeds in the bracket and of course Caleb Bang Pang and Roberto as well so it was a cool wrinkle in Sacramento and really 2024 is off to a brilliant start the man the myth the bastiodon the Bastiodon lover himself. We have the one and only Caleb Peng in second place here at Portland, Oregon. Let's hear it. Congratulations. So Caleb, this is becoming a bit of a habit for you here. Obviously, you have the casting, but Bastiodon, top cuts. We don't really see anyone else running it. What is it about Bastiodon that is inspiring you to run it so frequently? Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just really good. I, I don't know what else to say. You know, half the times, like half or more of the team is weak to it. So you just need to know how to position some of those matchups. Obviously, you, as you saw in the grand finals in the bracket reset, it, it doesn't always perform up to par, but I'm pretty happy I brought it still. And absolutely, getting second place now, being able to make it to a finals three times in a row, as you mentioned, that is something that not a lot of trainers do, that consistency there. What's one thing that, that, that you would say has helped you over the course as metas progress, as years go by, keeping that consistency in the high level of your gameplay? Um, honestly, I think it's just perseverance, right? And not giving up. Uh, there's definitely a lot of times you have bad leads, bad counter swaps, and you just gotta fight through, or you go to lose this bracket early, you just gotta power through, right? I had a little nightmares about Rubik's Master yesterday, but uh, able to find the win, just go a little further from that too. Great stuff from Caleb Peng, and again, congratulations Thanks. here. Top two at Portland, big round of applause here for Caleb Peng. And of course, there would not be a regional championship without a winner. First place here at Portland, Oregon, we have Abinov. Congratulations, amazing run. So Abinov, I believe that we had mentioned before that this was your first top cut in a regional and you just won the whole thing. 
So how do you handle the nerves getting to that top cut and just pu pushing through, persevering, skull debuff or not, and proving that at the end of the day, skill can triumph here over luck? Um, yeah, it was definitely a lot of nerves. Um, I tried to stay calm. I think the one time the nerves got to me was in the first set of the Grand Finals where I didn't play the best after the first game. but. If I might say one thing off topic, uh, I haven't done a lot of play Pokemon. I was in India, but I did do a lot of Sylph before this was a thing. And um, any kind of a Pokemon experience, even if it isn't uh, play Pokemon, is really helpful. It really builds your skill set. So anyone out there watching, just load up the game and start playing. I think it helps. Practice makes perfect, absolutely. And I do want to talk you through, as you mentioned in that first set, Set one, game number one. Loading into the grand finals here, seeing Chargebug into the Bastion on, but fighting back against all odds and avoiding the catch there. Kind of talk me through the thought process there as you try and fight back from near impossible odds in that game. Yeah, <laughs> I, I kept watching Caleb's games before and he kept leading Bastiodon and I told myself, don't be weak to Bastiodon lead, but I did it anyway. <laughs> and, and then I was like, okay, either I'm gonna lose this game or it's gonna be the most epic win of all time. So I was just going for it. And um, I think I predicted the catch and I was like, even if, I, even if he doesn't catch and I don't throw, I'll save the move and exit out anyway, but it all kind of worked out. I don't think, I think I got kind of lucky at the end, but yeah, it worked out. <laughs> Well, one thing that I do want to emphasize in that game as well was the end game mechanics is when the Bastion was brought back into the Charger Bug, the decision to throw two Volt Switches there, eight turns compared to the ninth turn of that SmackDown ending, allowing you to reach those back to back discharges and put it into dig range there. If you can tell us a little bit on what your practice in terms of mechanics, charge move timing, and how it helped along the way here with helping you become the regional champion here in Portland. I mean, yeah, the funny thing is um, two, three years ago, I was not the best at move timing and like, uh, move timing is something that's big in the Indian community and they would like rag on me for it all the time. Like, oh, Abhinav let through another move again. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's something I've practiced a lot. I think it's a really crucial part of the game. And in that moment, I, I knew that I needed two discharges. I'm, I'm, I can go back and check, but I think Bastion would have lived a dig plus a discharge. So I was like, the only win condition is two volt switches, survive three smackdowns, back to back discharge. And it all happened thanks to move timing, so yeah. Amazing stuff. And finally here, I imagine there will be quite a few people across the world here in the arena and across the world watching from a lot of places and as well India, as you mentioned, inspired by your gameplay here today. If you could say something to those trainers that you've inspired by your run to help urge them on to pick up Pokemon Go and start battling, what would that be? Um, that's a really tough question. All I would say is um, I joined the game late. I started playing like maybe two, three years after everyone else. There was a time when I had no Stardust. I had only like, my my Azumarill was like 15, 15, 15, which is awful IVs. But practice makes perfect, like you said. Slowly got better at the game. Uh, played a lot of friends, locals, and yeah, the outcome is this. And I'm here on top of the world, feeling amazing. So just keep at it, I guess. Absolutely amazing stuff. And with this win, Abhinav has qualified for the World Championships in Hawaii later this year, adding his name to the echelon, to the record books here of the vaunted trainers so far this season who have gotten to qualify for Worlds. So again, a big round of applause for your 2024 regional champion for Portland, Abhinav. Very great commentator. <laughs> Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Of course, I did not play perfectly uh, all the way throughout by any means. So there's definitely a lot for myself to learn even reviewing this footage, but hopefully I made the games interesting for you all. And shout out to anyone that was cheering me on throughout the live stream or even share some kind words after the fact. Like I said, I'm gonna break down all my strategy and my team compositions and why I built the team I did in a later video this week. So if you like this video, feel free to give it a like and share, subscribe for future content, Hit that notification bell so you don't miss my next video regarding the strategy behind my team and I'll catch you all next time.